greetings from Dakar. A beautiful day here in Dakar. Uh, I know that you are all in different places. It is a wonderful privilege to be sharing this space together. I will say to you, you're missing out. Uh, we have had some wonderful times uh, out here, including a conference like I've never experienced before, out in the open, open air concert I've heard, but open air conference is even better. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I just want to say a few words about the Africa Roundtable. For those of us who uh, began here in, in Dakar outside, uh, we know that this is the second edition in uh, 2022. Uh, the first uh, Africa Roundtable this year we held in, in Berlin in the spring, in May. And uh, we are pleased to be here uh, at your invitation, Minister. Thank you so much uh, for that, for, for bringing the Africa Roundtable here uh, at such a pivotal time. Um, what we're looking to do uh, here is to say, how do we achieve this 1.5 degree target that we as the global community have set out uh, when it comes to our climate goals and ambitions? How would, do we supply our continent, Minister, with energy? We're talking about the continent of Africa. How do we do this with the partnership of our friends uh, in Europe? How do we help our friends in Europe overcome their emergency when it comes to the energy crisis that they are currently experiencing? And we're talking about an energy transition. We say that it needs to be just. We say that it needs to be green. But how is this going to be financed? And of course, we're looking at ways in which we can also restructure our food systems, that we can invest in climate-smart agriculture so that we address the issue of hunger. So this is the spirit at which we would like to get into these conversations. And Minister, I don't want to waste any more time now, but I do want to take a short moment and introduce you, uh, because you have now taken over uh, the portfolio in the Ministry of uh, the Economy, Planning and International Cooperation. Uh, in other countries, those are three separate ministries, um, but under your capable hands, uh, you have this wide-ranging uh, portfolio. It's um, a position that Minister has held uh, since September 2022, and we've got to celebrate a moment to say she's the first woman uh, to hold uh, that ministry. So I can please indulge yourself in. <laughs> These things are, are worth celebrating um, every time that they happened. Uh, before she was in the ministry, she was the regional director for West and Central Africa uh, for UN Women. Uh, and before that, she spent a good decade at the International Finance Corporation. Uh, so Minister, uh, please, the floor is yours now. Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Minister Olumashi Yes. So Minister will speak in French uh, for the benefit of those who need your interpretation so you can prepare your gadgets for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Christine, for giving me the floor. Before I start my, my speech in French, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to, the, to Senegal, the country of Teranga, the country of the champions of the African Cup of Nations, <laughs> and a country that is very hopeful in Qatar 2022. So, I, you, you can imagine the excitement. So yeah. welcome to Senegal, welcome to our beautiful country. Uh, some very familiar faces in the room. Um, and I know that uh, with all your knowledge and expertise uh, that these two days spent in, in Dakar, uh, we will uh, leave here with some strong recommendation. And most, more, more importantly, we would like to, to leave Dakar with some very quick, concrete uh, actions and, and uh, advocacy that we would like to do. So while everybody has the translation on, I can speak French now. <laughs> uh, mesdames et messieurs les représentants du gouvernement allemand. Ladies and gentlemen, representative of the German government, members of government, a representative of the various ministers, general director of GPI, dear Ingrid, Mr. Ambassador of the German Republic, with whom I spent uh, nearly three days this week. So when we saw each other today, we smiled at each other, because since Monday we've had the honor of uh, co-chairing several meetings. Dear members of the, inter the national press, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the uh, Senegalese government, as well as in my own name, I'd like to wish you uh, greatest welcome in Senegal, the 
Teranga country and it is a great pleasure for me to co-chair the Africa Roundtable with the prestigious members of the German Senegalese society as well as members of the development community in a wider sense. I would like to thank GPI for picking Senegal to host the very first of such meeting on African soil since the launch of the first meeting chaired by His Excellency Macky Sall, President of the Republic of Senegal. The uh, Roundtable has become a major platform to strengthen the framework of this win-win partnership between Europe and Africa. This topic uh, together for a just green transition comes at the right time in phase with the economic and geopolitical uh, issues of the time. It is also a major pillar for the development of the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa has been dealing with several simultaneous crises, unprecedented crises such as an economic one, health, energy, climate and food. The COVID pandemic has uh, put into question major achievements with regards to the sustainable development goals in terms of funding the development and uh, reducing poverty. Let me share some figures about the growth of Senegal. Until 2019, we had a growth rate, an average growth rate of 6%. In 2020, during COVID, our growth rate went down to 1.3%. And in 2021, we had a recovery, economic recovery, with a growth rate of 6.1% of our GDP. In 2022, which is a quite a difficult year with the Ukraine war, with Russia, we are expecting a growth rate of 4.8%. But if we want to further our development, we will need a two digit growth rate, and we are expecting to achieve this next year. Sustainable economic recovery was strongly impacted by the war in Ukraine and its consequences on the prices of basic essentials and energy resources. Such crises remind us even more of how urgent it is for us to find answers to the issue of the funding of African economy to help the continent to quickly fulfill its economic development in favor of a sustainable well-being for its population. Such sustainable development has to go through a just green transition, or just energy transition, to help African states to use transition gas, transition energy such as gas, so they can provide electricity at an affordable price to more than 640 million Africans who do not have electricity. This is imperative if we want an inclusive development and this goes in line with the targets of the sustainable development for 2030 and the agenda 2063 of the African Union. Having said that, it is worth mentioning that Africa only stands for 3% of energy emissions and yet we are strongly impacted by the con on the percentage of emissions of Africa and the report is mentioning 10%. We disagree. <laughs> I, I saw the incremental change from 3 to 10. I don't know on which day, which, what, on what they're basing it, but I just wanted to say that I read the paper and I don't, I think that 10% is a bit bold. This is, this is evidence by desertification droughts, floods, which are the kind of plagues that we are dealing with, yet our resources are limited. I think that many African countries think that we only stand for 3% of all emissions, yet have to deal with all the consequences of climate change with our restricted 
national budget, even though we are not the main polluters. So this is a shared responsibility, hence our work uh, in advocating uh, for the means. So this is why the subject of funding is a major pillar to help our countries not only to mitigate climate change, but also to adjust by investing on renewable energies at affordable prices. Senegal has gone down this way with a 32% share of renewable energies in its energy mix. Let me mention some examples, such as the Thai Bai Diai power station, 150 megawatts, Sun Power Stations with 123 megawatts in Lias, as well as another one by Synergy and Tecmerema with 30 megawatts each. In the urban transport sector, our express regional train, or TER, from Dakar to Diam Yadio in the first phase, that's already in operation, and later on from the airport to IBD in the second phase, will have a positive impact on climate by cutting emissions connected to uh, transportation, will also be a vehicle to boost the structural transformation of the Senegalese economy. This is one of the targets of the emerging Senegal plan, which is our national development plan. This is also the reason why we uh, advocated at the G7, G20 in Bali, as well at the COP27, in favor of a just energy transition while abiding to the commitment from the uh, Paris conference. But we need to do more with our partners. This roundtable is a great opportunity for us to remind the international community the need of Africa to lead a fair green transition. It is essential that African countries be given enough time and financial resources, concessional financial resources, to succeed in transitioning towards a green economies that requires massive investment in several sectors such as energy, health, environment and agriculture, more specifically to help out small rural farmers to adjust to climate changes and to protect the livelihood of the most vulnerable. And Christine mentioned in her introduction the climate smart agriculture and climate resilient agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is on this particular aspect that Senegal intends to work with its partners such as Germany towards a just energy transition partnership that will help a country use its natural resources to meet its industrialization needs and job creation needs in phase with our economic development plan. I hope that uh, thanks to this roundtable we will come up with precise and feasible realistic recommendations that could help our partner countries to mobilize the required resources to turn Africa into the continent of the future. And I now declare open the third edition of the roundtable here in Dakar. Thank you very much for your attention. really laying uh, the, the foundation for our discussions uh, here today. Um, we're now going to pivot uh, and go over to uh, somebody who's joining us uh, online, and please just allow me a short moment uh, to pre prepare my intro introduction uh, from Mr. Kunduns, who is a representative of the European Union. Um, the Africa Roundtable is about partnership. And it is in the spirit of partnership between Africa and Europe, and we've heard that from you, Minister, uh, that we can address our common challenges. So I am reliably informed that Mr. Kunduns is, is standing by. He is the Director General for International Partnerships at the EU Commission. Uh, Mr. Dunes, we 
are ready to hear you. I just want to establish, well, I can see you. Uh, if you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear me because I can see you. Oh, fantastic, there we go. And now we even see you on the, on the wider screen. So uh, I will be handing the floor to you uh, right now, Mr. Dunes. Thank, thank you very much. And indeed, I can hear you, but unfortunately, I cannot see you. So I'm actually speak, speaking to a, to a screen where I, I, I have no interlocutor, but I will, I will nevertheless imagine uh, you, you all sitting there in Dakar and, uh, and, and regret, honestly, that I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not with you, uh, because uh, that would definitely have been my preference. Although I understand that there have been some technical challenges yesterday related to, uh, to a storm. So I, I hope in any case that everyone's fine. Um, but I'm, I'm indeed uh, very happy um, to be able to participate um, because I think uh, that uh, the topic of renewable energy uh, and energy in general really um, holds all the elements uh, that, that we need for a very strong partnership uh, between uh, Europe and Africa. And that's indeed what we are working on. I know that uh, obviously, I mean, when you look at a room through a hole in the door, um, which we sometimes tend to do, very much focused on the, the immediate crisis we need to solve. You only see part of it. But I think that if you take a step back, it all becomes much more, um, much more clear. I mean, we're, we're all going to go uh, through this kind of big uh, energy transition. Uh, and even if the starting points are very different, not just between Europe and Africa, but between individual countries, both within Europe and, and Africa. I think that the direction we are taking is, is, is very, very um, similar. And I see, honestly, a huge potential for a real strategic uh, joining up. If you look at it from a European perspective, it's very clear that even if right now uh, we, are, we are looking in the immediacy for alternative supplies of oil and especially natural gas through LNG to, to, to deal with the immediate impact of, of, um, of, uh, of Russia's war against uh, Ukraine. At the same time, we are really accelerating our energy transition. And it also means that over time, this quest for import of renewable energy and then notably green hydrogen uh, and what is related, the broader scheme of things related to the to the green transition, uh, which also extends to critical raw materials, are strategic issues for the EU, where a partnership with Africa is absolutely essential. And if you look at it from the African point of view, I mean, the starting point, I think, is, is very well known, which is that if you look at the wealth, I mean, it's the world's richest region when it comes to renewable energy resources. 60%, it's, it's the International Energy Agency that has said that if you look at purely solar energy, 60% of the ideal locations identified worldwide are indeed in Africa. And then yet, if you look at the, the investments that are done, I mean, the country, the, the, the continent only hosts 1% of photovoltaic installation. So 60% of ideal locations, only 1% of the photovoltaic installations. And that's true for broader investment uh, as well. If you look at only 4% of global power supply investments go to Africa. That translates also obviously in an access issue. Uh, it's a well-known figure, the 570 uh, million people in, in Sub-Saharan African, uh, Sub Africa that not, don't have access to uh, electricity with all what it implies in terms of health, education, but also uh, industrialization. And so I think that if you put these two elements together, there's absolutely a partnership where we basically strengthen each other's strategic autonomy, strengthen each other's resilience in this field, and we do it in a way that uh, is, a, is a real win-win. Uh, now, that's exactly the value proposition we are pursuing under uh, the Global Gateway, which is our uh, offer to partner countries to embark on together in partnership uh, on a multitude of infrastructure-related investments, but obviously 
energy is is a is a big one and we're looking at it in a in the 360 degree uh, way under this Africa EU green energy initiative which was uh, discussed and, and agreed upon at the summit between Europe and Africa in February uh, of, of, uh, of this year. There's obviously a hard component, a hard infrastructure, a hard investment in, in infrastructure for generation capacity. There's a soft component where we look at how we can mobilize technical assistance uh, to, to work on the enabling environment, to work on pipeline development, feasibility studies, to work on capacity building, to work on regulatory environment. And then we do this in a, let's say, coherent way at national level, at regional level, where we are financing regional power pools, and at continental level, where there's a whole dynamic of the, of the, uh, the continental energy market. And let me just give you a few examples. I, I was two weeks ago in, uh, in, in Niger, where I actually visited uh, a 30 megawatt a solar power plant, which we are building together with Agence Française Développement uh, in, in Goro Bandou, just outside uh, Niamey, built with local uh, labor force. And we're building a second one in Agadez, um, 19 uh, uh, megawatt uh, power plant. Or if I look at what we're doing in Mozambique, uh, where we've been heavily investing in the production of renewable energy, hydropower, wind, and solar but also in the distribution of at least 185 megawatt capacity of renewable energy through these productions. So you see how the hard investment component combined with software, with the work that is needed on the environment, the bankability is absolutely essential. And we are working with African partners to make that happen. And the final point is when I say we, uh, I'm not just talking about uh, the, uh, the European Commission and even less so about the, the department I'm running for international partnerships. It's really a collective endeavor uh, between uh, the Team Europe, so us, our member states, our development finance institutions, our agencies like, like GIZ, Expertise France and so on, with African partners. And we are mobilizing the private sector by de-risking investments. And I think that this is how, we, how we're starting to get the ball rolling uh, together with with our uh, with our african friends so i see huge potential in a number of areas uh, for this strategic partnership and definitely renewable energy is one of them i hope you've managed to hear me and even see me floor is yours thank you so much for that we heard the message loud and clear um, what the director general did over there was to talk about the framework that the European Union is providing, uh, with which it, it wants to engage, and that is the global um, and gateway. And we can have further discussions uh, about exactly how we can tap into the opportunities that the global gateway uh, provides us uh, as partners in terms of realizing some of that investment and that assistance and technical operation that we need uh, as it comes to getting energy to, to this continent. Our next speaker, is uh, going to be joining us now also on the virtual platform. I would like to introduce Mr. Halke Engel. He is partner at the Nairobi office for McKinsey and Company. I just want to establish that he is, well, I can see him in the blue shirt um, and I can see you nodding and I saw a thumbs up from you. That is, you can also uh, see me, but please um, take the floor now uh, as you give us um, your perspective. I, I want to point out that of course we are aware that McKinsey has also provided uh, a report for us um, and if you could now take the floor, uh, Mr. Engel. Thanks very much. I hope the audio is working well. I put on my, my fancy big, big earphones. Apologies for the for the Mickey Mouse look, uh, but it does help the, the audio quality. Um, thanks for having me today. Um, so what I'll try and do in the next couple of minutes is really try and give a bit of a whirlwind tour to frame a few different aspects of the climate challenge as it pertains to the to the continent, to Africa. Um, and for most people, when they think about climate change in Africa, they think about physical risk, right? And rightfully so. And, and, and we all know Africa is probably the region most exposed to the changing climate. Um, and, and just put some numbers to it. Um, if you look globally at all the people considered most at risk from the changing climate, a third of them live in Africa. Within Africa, that's 370 million people or another you know, a third of the population 
uh, they live in areas that are expected to experience high levels of climate hazards and that are highly vulnerable to those hazards. Um, and that's the second important point to highlight here, right? The continent typically has much lower levels of adaptation and resilience. Uh, if you look at some of the work that, that colleagues have done to score countries on their preparedness levels, 80% um, of African countries land in the lowest bands globally for, for preparedness and resilience. Um, and of course, you have the fact that insurance and savings typically in Africa are much lower than in other countries. So there's less capability to rebuild after disaster strikes. Um, and of course, it's important to highlight that the direct impacts are just part of the picture here, the direct hazards and the direct immediate um, uh, human suffering that, that they cause. Of course, there's also then the second order impacts, migration, social political unrest, potentially even conflict that this could cause, and it could also have global repercussions. Um, but physical risk is probably not the, the full story. Uh, on, the, on the risks of ledger, we also have what's called transition risks, you know, the, the, the risks arising from the structural changes that the world economy undergoes as we transition to, to net zero. Um, in this context, it's helpful to, to point out that African economies are typically more dependent on commodity export. 16% of Africa's GDP is in one way or another commodity related. Um, and here's two particular phenomena that are important to highlight under the banner of, of transition risk. Uh, the first one is the shift towards lower carbon footprint commodities. Yeah, the global market is increasingly pricing carbon content alongside cost um, as big corporates uh, aim to reduce their, their carbon footprint along their supply chains. Um, and the challenge here is that many, if not all, but many African commodity producers tend to be more emission intensive, more energy intensive. Um, and so if we assume you know, a robust carbon price, another way that, that carbon is, is factored into cost, we would actually see many African producers move to the right of the, of, the, of the supply cost curve and hence eventually be pushed out of the market. The second effect is uh, the decrease in demand in fossil fuels as the world economy uh, transitions to net zero. Um, and again, many African fossil fuel producers tend to be at the more expensive end um, of the supply cost curve. And so as demand shrinks, um, they can be pushed out of the market. Um, if we look at a 1.5 degree pathway and a one estimate, uh, up to 80% of African fossil fuel production could be uncompetitive by 2040. And so given this, the, the strong dependence on African economies on commodities, uh, this is a major, major issue to, to manage. Yeah? When without strategic action, uh, we estimate that up to $150 billion of commodity revenue and up to a million jobs would be at risk. Um, so you're starting to see even the risk side is, is quite nuanced here. And it does link to mitigation, right? Because of course, one way that the, the transition risk could be ameliorated is through strong sustained climate action through strong mitigation action. So let's talk about the decommunization side of the, of the ledger. Um, and it is important to point out to begin with that um, we cannot stabilize the global climate without strong climate action by African countries. Um, and that's because even though Africa has very low per capita emissions, actually, if you tot up all the emissions, not just the energy related CO2 emissions, which amount to three to 4% of global emissions, but also the, the other greenhouse gases and the emissions from land use, we actually find that Africa as a whole accounts for roughly 10% of global emissions. And then of course, when you factor in the growth rates that we hopefully will see on the continent, uh, that share of global emissions will only increase. Uh, so it is imperative for the global net zero transition that we also see strong, climate action on the continent. Um, when you look at the decommunization pathways that African countries will likely follow, they'll differ quite markedly likely from those for, for example, of Europe or, or North Africa, North America, um, for a few reasons. Now, the, the, the economic mix, of course, is different. Now, we have a stronger focus on basic materials production. We also have more rapid economic growth, urbanization rates, but we also have more constrained government budgets and capabilities. And of course, we have the, the absolute paramount imperative of sustained inclusive growth and development to advance living standards and health on the continent. So if we put this together, uh, a few characteristics of the net zero transitions of African countries stand out in contrast to what we used to, to see in, 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 for example, the, the European plans. The first one is that we'll see a strong emphasis on decentral power solutions, given that there, we don't have a strong existing grid yet in many parts of the continent. We will see some build out of gas power capacity because we need some dispatchable assets to balance the, the renewables. Uh, 
but actually not a, a lot of use of gas, but we do need the, the assets to, to come online as, as needed to, to balance out the, the renewables volatility. Um, we'll see a greater emphasis on, on land use, uh, agriculture, and clean cooking, given the relatively larger share of, of emissions that those sectors have. We'll also see that in some sectors, the transition will be slower. Uh, for example, renewables built out requires institutional capability built up, skills built up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, electric vehicle take, take up will be constrained by the by the availability of secondhand cars that are still the mainstay of, of mobility in many parts of, of Africa. Um, now, the good news here is um, that there are clear opportunities for the continent to meet its economic development goals and increase resilience while also participating in the global transition to net zero. Um, and Kuhn already talked about the energy access challenge. Now there's 600 million people still without energy access. And of course, we all know that now new build renewables in most parts of the continent are cost competitive with the existing coal and gas powered uh, power generation. And so renewables really are the lowest cost energy source uh, across vast parts of the continent. And so I mean, when we pursue that, that renewables build off path, we could see literally hundreds of thousands of jobs being created by 2030 already. Um, but it, it needs work, and, and, and I think Kuhn already touched on, on some of the key ingredients there. Yeah, we need kind of waves of procurement in each country to, to drive down risk and, and get more comfort for the, for the capital markets to invest into those. Uh, we'll need the, the JET piece, yeah, the fossil renewable transformation programs. We probably need also more regional grid integration, infrastructure build out, and we will need a dedicated mechanism or set of mechanisms uh, for distributed off-grid renewable build out, yeah, technical assistance, project development, blended finance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second major pillar is probably around agricultural resilience and productivity, right, given the, the large share of, of emission that, that land use change still has on the continent. And again, there's a clear opportunity and a synergy with development here, yeah, given that we need to intensify, not extensify agriculture. So to um, make sure that we do more with the land that we've already converted to agricultural um, use, yeah, so better use of, of inputs, training, financing for smallholder farmers, but also reducing supply chain losses to better transport, storage, refrigeration. Um, there's also an element of restoring degraded lands, uh, where again, smallholder farmers can play a vital role. Um, an underappreciated opportunity in the in the agriculture space could also be alternative proteins, which is expected to become a ma major market in the, in the developed world, could account by some measures for up to a billion uh, US dollars in export value uh, over the next decades. And of course, agricultural resilience is its own own topic. Yeah, but we need better information, better crops, better technology, insurance, and financing uh, for African farmers. Um, last but not least, and again, Kuhn touched on this already. Yeah, I think there's there's some truly exciting export opportunities that arise from the global net zero push. Yeah? And, and Kuhn talked about hydrogen and renewables as a as a key energy vector, where there's strong synergies uh, with the European and African agendas. Um, uh, the, the, the opportunity to valorize stranded renewable resources on the continent. Um, we estimate that we could see by 2050 between 20 to 40 megatons of hydrogen derivative exports from the continent, which could create millions of jobs, uh, up to 100 billion US dollar in, in GDP contribution. And of course, there's again synergies with the renewable deployment for domestic use, given that you create a strong off-taker that lowers the, the project risk and attracts investors to the continent. The other opportunity in terms of new exports I would highlight is, is carbon credits, where the emergence of global carbon markets um, has actually given rise to a new export commodity potentially for, for Africa, allowing the African countries to valorize the natural capital without actually depleting it. Um, you may have seen the, the launch of the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative in, in Sham a couple of weeks ago, um, right. which aims by 2030 to support up to 100 million livelihoods uh, and, and targets of $100 billion in export revenue by 2030 through, through tapping the carbon market opportunity and, and establishing carbon credits as a major export commodity for Africa. Um, so that was a bit of a you know a whirlwind tour through the the, the 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 climate change topic as regards Africa and as you see it's it's quite a complex picture right there is physical risk but there's also transition risk um, there is a decarbonization imperative yeah the need to 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 see strong climate action in Africa to to stabilize the global climate but there's also a lot of synergies and a kind of interplay positive interplay reinforcing interplay between decarbonization climate action and the the inclusive development agenda. Um, and the opportunity to, to valorize renewables, natural capital, and to diversify and strengthen African economies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Engel. That's Hauke Engel talking to us there from 
uh, the Nairobi office of uh, the Policy. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for that overview there as we would have it. Uh, we will stay uh, with the uh, virtual participants and I, I see you, Dr. Cookies. Um, if you can hear me, please give me a thumbs up. I know that you're not able to see us. Uh, okay, I see the thumbs up, but we can see you and you're looking good and sharp. I guess my initial question is, I know that when I see you, the chance is not far away. Um, and I'm wondering if he's somehow lurking in the background. This is the thing you need to understand is wherever the chancellor is, uh, Dr. Yul Cookies uh, is there. And I'll explain why, because of the position he holds. He is the state secretary uh, in the chancellery. He is also the G7 uh, Sherpa uh, in the federal uh, chancellery. Of course, I think you would know better than anybody, um, Dr. Cookies, what it's been like here in Senegal as the country has been leading the continent with the African presidency because Germany has been leading uh, with the G7 presidency as well. So the floor is now yours, Dr. Cookies. It's great to have you back at the at the round table. We were together in, in, in the spring uh, and um, it's uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you now as we talk about uh, the just energy transition uh, in the context of everything that we've seen happening, the movement we've seen also in Germany uh, as you battle an energy crisis. So over to you, Dr. Cookies. Thank you, and uh, many thanks for the invitation. I regret not to be able to be in Dakar, uh, but of course I look forward to uh, to meeting you in person at um, at a future meeting. Um, and of course, I remember well the uh, the um, Africa Roundtable in Berlin in the uh, in the Parliament on the topics of uh, economic recovery and financial inclusion. Um, which was very important for the work that we did uh, leading up to the G7 summit. And a lot of those impulses, of course, then got carried over into the G20 debates. So um, I'm glad that I can uh, present some of the results. Um, both the G7 and the G20 made strong commitments for a just uh, green transition in Africa. Um, um, of course, uh, I will focus a bit on the a contribution from, from my country. So when we talk about the green transition, of course, energy is uh, is top of mind. Um, and uh, Africa, of course, um, as um, I just heard from the last discussant, uh, um, we have consensus that uh, Africa has a very substantial um, potential regarding renewables. Um, and of course, we all agree that this can play a very vital and important role in the green transition of the continent, uh, but also on um, simply creating um, low levelized cost of energy um, um, sources of electricity, um, heat, and um, potentially um, um, the energy supply can be improved and increased at uh, at reasonable costs in a very in a very reliable way. Um, so that can, of course, lead on the one side. Um, to the decarbonization goal that we all have, but also help um, the industrialization goal and um, the broad supply of electricity and heating uh, to the citizens of Africa, which of course also is a very big um, goal in terms of cooperation and development cooperation. On the other side, of course, we all agree that this requires massive investments. Um, and the concept of the Just Energy Transition Partnerships are, of course, the acknowledgement that uh, part of these investments uh, will have to come from abroad, from a mixed um, um, source of public and private support. Um, um, and on the other side, the, the positive element that was also discussed uh, um, when I listened in um, um, with the goal of creating highly qualified, well-paying jobs, I think that's also a very important um, component of the um, Just Energy transition partnership concept, because very often we have in the high carbon emitting um, sources of energy, of course, a lot of jobs that need to be compensated and replaced. Um, so in that sense, if we solve those problems, we can create win-win situations for Africa. Um, the, the other debate that we're having increasingly, the last um, of which was at the G20 summit in Bali, where um, President Macron hosted, among others, uh, President Macky Sall, the Chancellor, the Commission President, um, and the Dutch Prime Minister, together with uh, um, um, the bosses of the IMF and the World Bank, um, Georgieva and Malpass. Um, and the discussion 
focused for one hour only around fertilizers. And uh, I was just telling a group uh, from uh, Senegal that visited me this morning um, that uh, President Macky Sall has an enormously detailed knowledge of the fertilizer industry, what um, is required for that. Um, and of course, uh, the question of um, local fertilizer production is one that is very much top of mind given the supply so shortages due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the um, ensuing um, food crises that we've been seeing. And of course, um, energy is a big topic in that. Um, of course, we also know um, in this context and others that there is a transition energy source um, um, of, of fossil gas. And I know, of course, this plays a particular role in Senegal, but potentially other African countries as well. Um, we agreed at uh, COP26 in Glasgow and at the G7 in Elmau <clears throat> that in principle, we are um, ending new direct public support for international unabated fossil fuel energy sectors. But we, of course, also, as was discussed uh, broadly, uh, defined that in the current exceptional circumstances, limited exemptions um, can, can be defined um, that have to be a clearly defined and outlined by each country that need to be consistent with our international obligations um, regarding the one and a half degree limit, the goals of the Paris alignment. Um, and of course, we stick to those agreements and commitments. Um, and, but we are very consciously working on uh, on defining exactly what the exemptions mean. Um, and of course, in defining these exceptions, we uh, want to take specific um, account of the special needs and requirements um, of African states in general and uh, Senegal specifically. And as you know, this was a this played a role at the chancellor's visit in Dakar, and he um, very explicitly stated that uh, that he completely understands those uh, local requirements. Um, um, of course, it all has to be combined with ambitious um, build-outs of the renewable space, which for electricity um, um, can be a much cheaper um, source of, um, of energy as, as gas. Uh, but of course, we um, completely understand all of the difficulties of intermittency and availability, um, storability, et cetera. So in that sense, I think um, it's all about finding a mix, just like in um, Germany and other European countries, how do we um, um, solve the current acute problems while at the same time um, devising a plan for the gradual decarbonization of our of our economies? And that is what was the G7 and the G20 was all about. At the G7, we resolved to set up the uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment, um, which of course um, given the current needs and requirements, has a very strong focus on energy, but of course also health and education and other transport and other important infrastructure aspects. Um, the EU's contribution to the, um, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investments is Global Gateway, and we are um, very committed um, that uh, as a member state of the EU, we um, support this program um, the first big project um, in terms of infrastructure in Africa that Germany is um, actively um, supporting and investing in and providing public funding for um, is a very substantial build out of the railway system in Egypt, um, um, which is financed by very strong support by the federal German government. Um, 9 billion euros is being invested into this um, in, um, infrastructure, of course, in a environmentally sound way, um, where, um, where, of course, the electricity that will power the trains will be produced by renewable energy. So in that sense, um, the, the, the elements can work well together. Of course, at uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, a key um, result um, was the question of uh, loss and damage. And um, the um, the G7 presidency, Germany, um, used we used our our convening power, so to speak, to 
um, set up and help to launch the Global Shield Against Climate Risks. We're com committing 170 million euros for this um, to launch um, the specific application of loss and damage. Um, and, um, and I think that's an important development. The Chancellor also used the various international fora to help promote the creation of an open and cooperative international climate club. Um, with this instrument, we want to strengthen the coordination um, between those countries um, that, are, um, that want to work more closely together on achieving our climate goals. Um, we're getting very strong feedback, and um, um, especially at, uh, at COP27, um, uh, we had a, a large um, attendance of countries outside of the G7. Um, so in that sense, the openness and the inclusivity of this um, of the climate club idea is really coming um, to fruition now. Um, the concept of jet peas, in our view, is a key and vital component of the climate discussion. We launched this in Elmau, building on the blueprint of the South African Just Energy Transition Partnership, um, where we, on the one side, want to encourage ambitious and accelerated um, energy transition, while at the same time taking into account and uh, managing and working together to resolve all of the social implications um, that uh, come from decommissioning of fossil uh, sources of energy. And um, we, um, we at the recent G20 meeting um, 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 launched the Jet Just Energy Transition Partnership with Indonesia, and we are advancing very well um, together in the co-lead with France on the um, Joint Energy Trend, Just Energy Transition Partnership with Senegal. So I think that's um, that's a very positive um, component of this. Um, at the same time, we um, decided and um, and um, pushed very hard to um, make sure that the multilateral development banks are also um, focusing on this topic, and um, we expressed financial support to the World Bank's high impact infrastructure finance facilities. So I think that's also a very important component of this, um, of this effort. Um, we then have a few initiatives at the level of the G20. The Compact with Africa um, was a contribution by the German presidency in 2017, but is getting, of course, um, um, more and more relevant. And the G20 reiterated the support for the Compact with Africa um, in in Bali, and I think um, um, the combination of economic reforms and um, and uh, strengthening the local SME um, community, I think, is a very important um, component um, of um, of this work. So, with that, um, I would like to thank you for the for the interest in the discussion. But uh, of course, if there are more questions, um, I'm sure the panel will be um, interested in engaging in a discussion afterwards. Thank you. You're quite right, and I thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Vicky, I know you can't see us, but I hope you heard the applause uh, in the room uh, for your, your remarks there. And I think this is a perfect moment now, after all these inputs, to perhaps open the discussion now. Um, and uh, you stay listening in, Dr. Cookies. I know you're leaning in over there, if you can hear me. I think we just need, we'll fix that so that you're able to hear us uh, clearly. But I'd like for us to open the conversation, and I see you, uh, Ms. Harkinson, uh, from Siemens Energy. Perhaps we can open uh, with you, please. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kukis, as well as uh, Mr. Kukundun, for your remarks. I think uh, it's quite clear that the support from the European Commission, as well as uh, the alliance between Germany and Senegal and Germany, and, and other key countries in uh, Africa is quite important uh, for us to reach some tangible uh, results. And I, I want to emphasize on the point of a private and public partnership, and, and that that is the way uh, we can reach progress. Um, and I always split things up in terms of technology, financing, and partnership. These three uh, areas are, of course, quite crucial. I would say, from a technology perspective, technology is already there. It's a mix of solutions, as Mr. Cookies also um, addressed, right? We need to be pragmatic and we need to 
we need to identify clear pathways, right? And um, I have the utmost admiration for countries like Senegal that have a very clear pathway. They, they know how they want to achieve uh, this. And it's clear ambition that 50% that should be renewable, so 50% should be based out of natural gas uh, fire uh, power generation. And we all know that we have the energy trilemma. Uh, it's the key uh, formula that everyone needs to resolve. And how that is resolved looks very different from country to country and from continent to continent. So uh, here is where in the dialogue between uh, the European uh, countries or the developed part of the, the countries and the underdeveloped part of the countries need to adhere to those differences, right? And we need to look at country to country and see what are the natural resources, where is the abundance of the solar and the wind, uh, and what kind of base load um, uh, energy solution is the best. Um, and in a country like Senegal that has uh, the fortunate um, findings of, of natural gas, it's, it's quite clear that that could provide uh, the base load, while of course the intensification of building up more renewables is, is critical. In a country like uh, South Africa, it's it's about the coal transition, moving yeah. away from coal. Yes. And uh, also there is, uh, of course, an abundance of, of solar and wind, wind, but we have to remember that from an engineering perspective, there are limitations. I would say, please open up to technology companies who, not I'm not just promoting myself here, or ourselves, Seamless Energy, I'm talking in general, there are many well-established technology companies who today mirror exactly how the current energy landscape looks like. And it, obviously, it, all major corporations are also needy and must have a clear transition on the organization, so, such do mm -hmm. we, right? And we are actively taking responsibility, making sure that a gas turbine is also ready for hydrogen, because hydrogen is key, it is clear that Africa can play a key role becoming a green energy right. hub, uh, not just serving its own needs uh, on the continent, but also as an exporter. Um, uh, and here, what we need to think to ensure that we don't have stranded assets is that we implement solutions today that can be repurposed um, and used for hydrogen. And here, I just want to emphasize from a technology perspective, so those technologies exist today, where it's a matter of changing combustions and burners uh, to run them on, on hydrogen. And, and this, is, uh, this is on the technology aspect. And then, of course, the electrolyzers and much of the technology needed for, the, uh, for batteries we know that the, the resources um, exist in abundance in many other countries. In South Africa, having 90% of the global iridium um, uh, available in South Africa, obviously that opens up for value creation and manufacturing of, of some of the key technologies such as electrolyzers in, in South Africa. So it's, it's really important to see it from, from that value creation and that uh, we help from the EU and the low part of the world to stimulate that industrialization happening also on the continent. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hawkinson. Uh, the view there from Siemens Energy, um, you know, the point you raised about the stranded assets, because the question has been, what are we going to do uh, with all these assets that we're, we're building uh, in, in the next 20 years when there's no demand uh, for our gas and, our, and, and other uh, fossil fuels? What do we do with those assets? And, and I like the, the aspect that you're bringing in um, about already having a renewable component building in, uh, built into, into the infrastructure that we're commissioning uh, now. And I'm hearing you say that industry needs clarity. Um, and the, our Senegalese friends have, have provided an example, as, as you are saying, industry needs a clarity. A government must be clear about what you want to do and how you want to get there. I want to stay uh, with industry. Uh, Mr. Niedermark, I'm going to come to you. You represent uh, the German Federation of Industries. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you've heard from the political leadership, uh, from, from what you heard from uh, the EU, from, from Germany specifically, uh, and perhaps tag on to what you, you, you heard from the South yeah, it was interesting to, to hear about the political framework and all these political ambitions. And uh, if you listen to our experts from uh, Mr. Uh, Hocker told us, 
about their findings, you can get uh, puzzled about the volume of tasks we are facing here. And in the end, uh, it's the industry uh, who has to do the job and to invest and uh, to equip all these uh, players uh, who should uh, play their role in this transition process with all the technology. And uh, we from BDI, we just uh, published our new African strategy. And the main message is that we finally have reached the situation to start uh, exploring Africa in a more intense way than we did before. Uh, we call it a restart. Um, and it comes at a pivotal point of uh, globalization where the buzzword is diversification. And so far we have been uh, making use of the low hanging fruit in other markets of the world and finally come to the conclusion that Africa uh, should be part of this and uh, we should focus, refocus on Africa and uh, make use of all the opportunities we see here. And it's, uh, Mr. Cook has used this word win-win. Um, in some parts of the world there is not that much of a win-win. Here we clearly see that. Uh, there is this need for common approaches for uh, Europe, Germany and the African partners. Uh, we need uh, raw materials and energy and Africa needs this transition, new jobs, investment, equipment for your industry, manufacturing here and we also need new markets. And that comes all in one go. Uh, it will take long. Uh, we are not naive. It will not happen overnight, but we have to start now. And uh, a good sign that this is a starting point is also the creation of the Pan-African Free Trade Zone. And uh, that is also a strong impetus for us. And I don't want to talk too long, too long but the thick, third pillar is of course high tech. We can also leapfrog in Africa and introduce high technology in all these transition periods. So we don't start again with low tech. Uh, Africa can tell high tech stories uh, today, uh, if I to use internal technologies in new space. Uh, so that's our approach, new start in the Africa strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Mr. Niederbach. I will come back into the room, but I just want to go online as well for, for my colleagues in the room. Indicate to me that you would like to say something by turning uh, your for this, uh, name, this way. Name tag. Then, your name tag, thank you so much. <laughs> um, you're assisting me there. Do it this way and then I know to come to you. But um, to our online participant, Mr. Dunes, uh, perhaps you, you've heard also from, 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 from industry, from the private sector, uh, Dr. Cookies as well, you were leaning in there. Uh, do you have any remarks at this stage from just what you've heard from the industry players? Mr. Dunes, I'll start with you. Well, uh, I mean, no, it, it's um, it's um, it's a very solid and well-known value proposition, and I think that uh, it is absolutely right um, that there is a real opportunity, as I've said also in my in my introduction, for this kind of win-win uh, partnership. We know that this is not going to happen overnight, but we do know that on the one hand, the industry's interest is really there; the opportunities are absolutely there. Of course, there are risks associated and there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done, but that's precisely where the combination of what uh, the, the public offer and what we can do with our investments, the things we are de-risking, the work we're doing with the European Investment Bank, with KFW, with the DEG, with Agence Française Développement, if we team up the public investment, the ODA, the capacity to de-risk, what the development finance institutions can do with the private sector, then exactly we get this kind of Team Europe approach I was talking about that can make some of these investments uh, happen. So for us, and that's what the Global Gateway is about, it is really about linking up what the private sector sees as opportunities um, with what public funding can do in terms of accompanying that through innovative financial instruments, but also the work that needs to be done on regulatory frameworks, capacity building for our partners, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And, and I think the tools are there, the opportunities are there, and what we're looking now at is to identify precisely in which countries, in which regions, these opportunities can materialize. Knowing that indeed, in a number of cases, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, 
pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies, impact assessment, and so on. But at the same time, there are plenty of them where a degree of maturity has been reached to really start delivering on the ground. And I think that you will see over the next couple of months and years, this kind of European portfolio, uh, combination of private sector and public sector, um, grow exponentially. I'm, 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 I'm absolutely uh, positive about that. That's also what came out of the summit our leaders had in February here in Brussels. That's what bilateral talks are about. So I'm, I'm actually very, uh, very positive about that. Thank you, DG. Um, Dr. Cookies, uh, give me a thumbs up if you, if you would like to say something now. Otherwise, I'll hand the floor over to a, a participant from the World Bank uh, in, in the meantime. Um, do you want to intervene now? Just very quickly, I, I fully agree with uh, with what uh, what um, Kern said. Um, I think the question that we have to ask is how can we reduce the funding cost by using instruments by the multilateral development banks, by the um, by the um, development um, public uh, promotional banks um, to crowd in public finance. I think the business case of renewables in general is is very clear. The key determinant that is skewing things um, in a more difficult situation for countries with high um, risk premia perceived by the market is, of course, that in long duration assets, uh, funding cost is such a massive um, input to um, to the levelized cost of energy. So I think we we really have to think carefully on what we can do to incentivize investment and crowd in investment by innovative uh, concept of risk sharing, risk mitigation, um, and those things. So um, we are very open and interested in um, in um, discussing this in more detail. Thank you for that. I, I want to give the floor now to the uh, Ministry of Energy and Petroleum here in Senegal, uh, Mr. Papa Sambaba. Thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, Madam Minister, I've got permission to put it in English. Uh, just to, uh, wanted to, uh, to to welcome, I think, this discussion. Uh, the uh, speech of uh, Excellency, I think, uh, present very well. Uh, actually, the um, the priorities of, of Senegal uh, in the frame of the energy sector, but also in the frame of the uh, energy transition. And uh, I would like to to to, to give, um, uh, I think, some uh, example of uh, social principles. Uh, next year, uh, in terms of partnership, Senegal we start to producing its uh, uh, resources in natural gas. Uh, and I think um, uh, when we discuss about the German and Senegalese relationship, really there are great opportunities there uh, in the uh, uh, say, uh, short term and medium term. Uh, with this natural, natural gas, the aim of Senegal is uh, not only to uh, exploit its natural resources, but also to gain enough resources, revenues in order to finance its uh, energy transition. So uh, with that, we are building a, a gas to power strategy uh, with the aim to switch from heavy fuel oil to uh, natural gas uh, uh, fuel uh, for the power generation. So um, this is really an opportunity, I think, in terms of uh, a partnership between uh, German companies and also uh, Senegalese uh, entities that are running uh, th this program. And the objective also, it is to be ready for hydrogen for green. I think uh, uh, Nadia uh, pointed out, it is to be ready for the next step, that is the clean, uh, clean energy. So all the gas uh, network, but also the power uh, uh, plant and the system that will be built will is, uh, and the regulation uh, aspect also. We are designing it with the philosophy to be ready for such a uh, uh, ne next step uh, for the uh, in the energy uh, aspect. And uh, as you said, uh, Senegal also have uh, made a lot of effort in terms of renewable energy penetration. Right now we have about 32%. And uh, uh, one area of uh, partnership that we, on which we need to focus really, it is in terms of batteries and how to stabilize the, the network. And uh, with that, 
uh, I think in the framework of the JP, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to stabilize such a uh, level of uh, renewable penetration, uh, but so in order to uh, help Senegal to go further, uh, we have a lot of sun, a lot of wind, so uh, uh, really Senegal wants to, to work on uh, its uh, two feet, so the renewables, but also the, the, the natural gas. So, uh, and when we talk about that, uh, the, the uh, subject on the financing cost is very important. And this is where uh, a, a combined approach of uh, public and private uh, sector from German and from uh, other partnership also uh, is really uh, necessary in order to decrease such a cost of, uh, of financing. If we talk a lot about IRENA, IIEA uh, studies, they all take has assumption five to ten percent of uh, cost of uh, capital. In Senegal, all, no uh, of our projects is financed at this level. So, uh, in term, really, uh, we need to to make a lot of effort in this uh, area in order to 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 have a just and uh, fair uh, energy transition. And um, this is, uh, I think, just to, 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 to end on this, uh, when we talk about energy transition, we uh, say we used to, to focus on the energy sector also. Really, it is a, a change of paradigm. We, all our economy will, is, uh, how to, will be impacted by this energy transition. We need to talk about uh, how to localize the um, uh, the uh, manufacture of the equipment that are needed. Uh, when we talk about any transition, if you move to the renewable energy, the energy security is also something really important. I think the McKinsey report uh, pointed out about 60% of our G GDP in Africa is uh, based on the commodity uh, related. And uh, out of them, it is uh, oh, oil and gas, and natural gas, etc. So, uh, if Africa and Senegal rely fully or at a high level on this renewable energy, uh, and we know that all the equipment are made out of Africa, in China, the minerals depend a lot or come a lot from Asia or China, 60% of uh, rare uh, earth are coming from China. So really we are talking about some um, a lot of subjects uh, that are put uh, under the table, but we need to put, put them re really on the table to discuss them, to see how we can secure the future of Africa in terms of energy, but also in terms of economic development. And uh, this really need to be, to be to enlarge the discussion, not only energy, but also technology, uh, industry, how to create jo job, local uh, employment, and also how to uh, facilitate the financing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that from the Ministry uh, of Petroleum here in Energy. Uh, I think it's very interesting um, what I found your, your remarks about this isn't just about exploitation. Uh, you're effectively saying that gas will finance Senegal's uh, green transition. Um, I want to stay on the continent uh, and come to you, uh, Dr. Dosuma, because you're at the African Development Bank, specifically uh, acting in, in the Department of Climate Change and, and Green Growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first mention that um, uh, we need to take this issue in a very broader way. For me, it's not just about energy transition, but it's about transitions. I mean transitions. We need to transition our food systems, our agriculture systems, our transport systems, our energy systems. So just energy transition should be part of the overall green transformation agenda of the continent. For me, it's very important because otherwise we just narrow down the discussion around one particular sector. I, I know where it's, it is coming from, but we know that there are very big issues on the other sectors as well, and we need to address them at, this, address them at the same time. And transition, even if it is in the energy sector, takes different forms and has different time frames. And we need to also consider that. And it depends on different specific contexts of every country. Even if you take the energy transition, uh, you know, uh, the context in Senegal is different from the context in Morocco or in, uh, in Chad or Niger. We need to
take that into consideration. So each country has to, there is no, 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 no one size fits all approach for that. We need really uh, to, to be context specific. And I also believe that um, we need to align that uh, with the national development priorities of each country because the priorities are different. Maybe it's energy here, it should be agriculture in another. The order, maybe the sectors are the same, but the order is, is a bit different. Uh, and, and also I think what is very important is the, how, how we are going to support that transition. You know, what are the means of implementation of this transition? It's not just about finance. It has also to do with technology. It has to do with capacity. All of those means have to be mobilized at the same time. You can have finance, but if you don't have the technology, it will be difficult to implement the transition. Um, and also, I think we need to, to, to look into how, how the, the transition will be su supported uh, you know, moving forward. The big elephant in the room is finance. We know that. But you know, what kind of finance we need for that transition? We know that public funds are limited. National budgets are limited. Everybody is talking about private sector finance, but how to leverage private sector finance is also an issue. Technology, as, as, as I said, is an issue, but you know, we, there are several barriers for technology transfer. Those that have technology are not the one who need the transition now. Those that need the transition don't have the technology. So we need really to find a solution to that equation as well. So for me, I think we need to have a comprehensive approach towards that transition, uh, not just a single out one sector. And also in terms of uh, support, I, I, I'm not talking about finance, in terms of support or, or means of implementation, we need to bring together those three elements, finance, technology, capacity, capacity at the same time. Thank you. And finally, gas. That's, I think, uh, it's, a, it's a term we want to avoid, but it should be part of the transition. And I'm glad that Senegal is considering that because, you know, gas as compared to, is, is a less polluting fossil fuel, 50% less polluting than, than coal. So if you want to transition, you have to transition from, 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 some, from A to B. We want to transition to renewable energy. Everyone, everybody is fine with that. We need, everybody loves tech, uh, renewable energy, but we know that there are issues with renewable energy. For instance, solar, it's intermittent. Uh, wind is also intermittent. When there is no solar and wind, what, 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 how do you do to compensate that? We need another source of what of my colleagues in the energy sector call uh, the base load. We need the base load. It could come maybe from, from gas, from coal or from hydro, but otherwise, if you rely your energy system only on renewable energy today, you are not going to sustain it. So we need to take that also into consideration. And natural gas is the perfect technology to transition over time to renewable energy because the transition takes time. It doesn't happen, happen open, overnight, and we need to also consider that. So I think we need for Africa in general, and I'm concluding on that, we need a comprehensive approach, but we need a good, a sound strategy, overall strategy for the continent, depending on the specific context of every region or every country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you talked about the elephant in the room. You said that was, that was finance. Um, and you've heard, uh, Mr. Kapin, that Senegal wants to walk on both its feet, uh, on the renewables as well as um, on, on the gas, and, and we have to say it as it is. Uh, but let's, let's stick to, to the theme of the finances, and you're representing the World Bank. Thank you. Um, I think there's another elephant in the room, and Madame la Ministre, you, in, in, your, in your introduction, you underlined a number that shocked me just as much as you. Uh, I hadn't looked at the share of, uh, of carbon emissions uh, that Africa is contributing, and 10% is, indeed seems very, very high. So I had the same, the same reaction as you. I sent a little WhatsApp message to my friends in DC, so say, can you please double check this number? And what I love at the bank, in two and a half minutes, I had a, I had a page long answer. <laughs> So I won't read to you the whole answer, but the gist of it is a very interesting and very important detail. You can only get, and my, our, our colleagues from McKinsey underlined this actually, you cannot get to this number without not accounting for LULUCF, which is basically land use, emissions from land use, land use change, and forestry. 
why is this so important and why do we have to underline this? Because these land use emissions, they're basically deforestation. They are four times higher than the energy emissions, the emissions from the African energy sector. However, they're counted separately. However, they're related to energy, more specifically energy poverty. These high emissions is 2.2 gigatons basically a year. These emissions are mainly driven by deforestation, which is mainly driven by energy uh, poverty. So one case, the most prominent case of energy poverty is if I don't have a, a gas stove or an electric stove, what do I use to cook? I use charcoal. I use uh, wood fuels. So this is one of the major causes of deforestation. If um, and and you can you can relate this also directly to climate change. You can in the energy sector we know very well um, if people cook with charcoal and they light their houses with kerosene lamps, they have a carbon footprint, and that carbon footprint can reduced can be reduced with fossil fuels. Um, LPG is an excellent fuel to substitute charcoal and to reduce deforestation. So is kerosene. So are clean cook stoves, for example. Um, on the electricity side, providing a household with electricity and substitute uh, a kerosene lamp is a contribution to carbon change, to, to climate emission reduction. So in a sense, if we combat energy poverty, we combat climate change. And I think this is very often a detail that's forgotten. And this is also in this context where within this transition, we need a lot more pragmatism and we need a lot more equity. And if you look at the big picture, if you look at Senegal, that pragmatism has a lot to do with natural gas uh, because natural gas is not only a transition fuel for Senegal, it also allows all the neighboring countries through the West African power pool to increase the absorption capacity for intermittent renewables of their own uh, power system. So for example, um, Mali, Burkina, Niger, they're all developing large solar parks. So it's perfectly possible to imagine that in a couple of years from today, they will be importing solar, clean solar energy to, to Senegal, but that solar energy will stop in about an hour from now. And then they will ne either need very expensive storage, which is still, I mean, battery storage is still expensive, or they will need the very limited large scale clean hydropower that we have in the region. A good way to, to substitute this and a good way to increase their capacity to absorb more renewable energy in their systems could be Senegalese uh, gas to power. So this is an important topic. And um, I really like the way uh, and the direction in which this discussion is going, because we've been probably a bit too categoric on this uh, very important topic. And the, the World Bank at the, at the last COP introduced a, a new mantra that I like a lot. And I think it has to do a lot to do with, uh, with pragmatism. We have to scale up in order to phase down. So we have to scale up not only climate finance, but we have to scale up energy access because energy access and combating energy poverty is in itself a means to combat climate change before we can think about and before we can work or maybe in parallel work on phasing down all the dirty fossil fuel-based power. And I think this is an important message and is something to keep in the back of our heads. Thank you. I would like to just ask if you could share that because now land use and deforestation is part of our gas emission quota. Um, you know, particularly countries in our region that, that, are, that we consider being the Sahel is extremely dry with very little, you know, uh, uh, trees to deforest. So that's interesting perspective. We would like to read that. Uh, but I, I like your point. And I, you know, I, the experts, when they speak, it's so, so clear. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about renewable energy, but you are so, so right. It's intermittent. Either you store or you have something else when the light on the winds are off, because now we are the wind season. For all the people staying in this hotel, you can see that we're having these very, you know, waves, high waves. And, and then by May, June, it's very quiet. So where do you find the wind for, for your, you know, wind park? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I, we we're almost having to bring this part of our discussion to an end, but I don't want to take the momentum out of our conversation. So why don't we get through the five uh, hands that I have in the room now? Let's do that quickly because we are still coming back for part two of our discussion. Um, uh, we can start that way with you, Professor, uh, and then we'll come to uh, Natalie from the Ibrahim Foundation. We'll go to KFW, we'll go to Asset, and we'll finish uh, in the end there. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your introductory comprehensive review of problems and opportunities. 
I would like to draw attention to two opportunities that um, Europe and Africa can, can enter into, which um, so far have not yet fully entered the agenda. Um, I, by the way, am very supportive of uh, what Dr. Alhamdu uh, Suma said, broadening the agenda beyond energy transition. If you look at the two most uh, greenhouse gas um, emitting sectors, it is building and construction, and it's the food sector. The construction sector, 40%, the food sector, 30%. We have to factor those two in. How? Um, the European Union uh, and um, her president um, have launched a so-called new Bauhaus initiative. Forget about the terminology. It's uh, um, making the construction sector energy sensitive with new material, new technology, um, new durability, getting quickly out of steel, concrete, and glass to the extent possible. The food sector uh, transition towards a sustainable bioeconomy. Now, Africa has already launched uh, bioeconomy initiatives. The East African Union has a formal one, and currently there is work on an in um, all Africa bioeconomy strategy. So transforming to what is the question? And um, I would suggest follow up discussions between you and the European Union on um, reforming the construction sector, bringing in the know-how and the food sector with, um, and linking up uh, our colleague from the European Union with bioeconomy and the new Bauhaus initiative. And there's also funding in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nathalie Delapalm from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress uh, with COP27 and with the last uh, six European summit. I would make to make two general comments to begin with. A, a lot of progress because we have come to a point where we understand that we should stop working in silos, climate, development, conflict. And we should stop also working within the silos, considering that one size fits all, as you, as you said. Um, I think the link between climate and development is really something important. And we can't indeed pretend that we are going to save the planet if it's to the expense of the people who are living on it. And when you are uh, on a continent where 600 million people are still lacking access to energy, where more than 900 have still lacking access to clean cooking fuels, it's very difficult to talk about transition. Uh, it's very difficult to understand how you're going to deal with this energy transition before you even have access to energy. Um, the second point is I'm struck, I didn't, I forgot about the count, but how many times in our discussion, the word opportunities has been used. And I think that this is absolutely key. Because there too, I think that we as partner of Africa should stop being in a position where we are wondering how to help Africa adapt to climate change, but rather to think about how Africa can help the world to adapt to climate change. Because Africa's potential is absolutely huge and needs to be developed. If I I'm coming back on the point of gas. On gas, I think this is absolutely key. Quite a lot of people are saying Africa could leapfrog and go to renewables immediately. This is wishful thinking. There is no way renewables only can allow immediately access to energy to the 600 million that are still lacking it. As has been said before, gas, which is the last polluting of all fossil fuels, is also needed to back up the intermittent uh, product provision of energy through renewables. And it is also needed in these uh, key industries for Africa's development, which are cement and steel, for example. Unless we use very advanced technologies, which is not the case yet, but probably there is uh, work to be made here 
to make progress in immediate decarbonation of these key industries for the development of Africa. Uh, and last but not least, um, uh, I, think, I think that Africa has no lessons to receive when it comes to renewables. 22 countries in Africa are already using renewables are their main source of energy in their energy mix. So it's not that Africa is not ready for renewables. It is indeed that we need to make progress, as has been said, not only in the production, but in the distribution, in the storage, and in the affordability of energy. And in this indeed, as you said, the implementation of the African trade agreement will be absolutely key because we need to get to size when it comes to market, otherwise it won't be viable. And last point on the Africa's potential, which probably hasn't been worked enough on at last COP27, and but has been mentioned several times here. Africa's potential for a green global economy is huge. Carbon sinking potential, without any doubt, and the critical fuels. But we need together to prevent what is generally called the natural resource curse. So we need to front load in the use of this, uh, of this critical material, uh, minerals, governance process, uh, be it transparency of contracts, uh, environmental sustainabilities, and the need to upscale the value chain and make sure that local processing is being made. Because this will also be the case to provide local jobs, which we all know are a key challenge for African governments. The last point on finance, which has been mentioned several times. Finance is absolutely key. And I, I really think that what Kun Duns was mentioning about the mixed, the private public partnership that we can build here is absolutely key with two caveats or two points. Um, someone I can't remember who talked about risk. I think one of the issue on risk is the need to cover it. And there indeed public uh, finance can help, but also to assess it properly. And there we have an issue, which is the, the I mean, the quality of risk assessment when it comes to investing in Africa, which has led many to begin with President Makisal to ask President of African Union to plead for an African rating agency. We certainly need to make progress on rightly assessing risk when it comes to Africa, because for the time being, it's still a little bit, uh, still a little bit uh, complicated. So that were my main points. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, the voice there from the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen in the room, I've got to go back online because we had an appointment uh, for Dr. Vera Songwe. Uh, she is now on time for, for her speaking engagement. So please allow me to, to go uh, to Dr. Songwe, who is now chair of the Liquidity and Sustainability uh, facility. Dr. Songwe, I know that you cannot, well, you should be able to see us. Um, if not, I hope that you can at least hear us because I now want to hand over to you. I'm not going to speak much because uh, you, you, you've been having a long conversation. Uh, uh, Ingrid asked me to talk about the Songwe Stern report on climate finance, but I just wanted to come back on a point that uh, 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 Natalie raised and, and, and to clarify that point a little bit uh, 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 so that we are clear on it. We don't need an African rating agency. This is a very, very important thing. What we need is better interaction between African countries and rating agencies so that uh, you know, the, the conversations between them is more systematic, that there is transparency in the conversation so that when the rating agencies come to do their ratings, they have the data that they need. And the reason I say that, and I do it very quickly, is I give the case of Japan during the financial East Asia financial crisis. Japan also said the same things. We don't like rating agencies who will create ours. They created three. Essentially, the three rating agencies that were created by Japan totally mimicked the big four. And so they became not so useful. So what they ended up doing was being very effective at developing corporates and their sovereigns to deal with the larger rating agencies. Um, I think the, 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 the sort of creation of a, of a 
sovereign rating agency will buy us the, the playing field. Today on the continent, we have some very powerful rating agencies coming out of Senegal, Ivory Coast, South Africa, Kenya. And, and we would like those rating agencies to stay market-based and not be public facing uh, in, their, in, their, in their element. So I think this, this is an important point going forward as more sovereigns go to the market that we develop uh, the capacity to engage with them. Now on, 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 on the, 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 the future of development, I just, uh, I'm in New York actually, because I just started the liquidity and sustainability facility, which is essentially to take away uh, the liquidity component or the liquidity premium from African sovereigns. When African sovereigns go to the market, what happens is that, you know, because our, our issuances are not liquid, what the bondholders and the asset managers, when they buy our issuances, don't know what to do with it. So they charge us for keeping resources uh, that are not that they cannot recycle. And so we do need, I think, in the long term, to be able to deepen our financial markets, create capital markets that can allow us then to provide them with the kinds of facilities that are needed to recycle the resources. We are still in a development SDG stage where we need long-term capital, 30, 40 years. The IMF for the first time now has the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which is essentially a long-term uh, a, a capital window. We need more of this kind of liquidity. And I think that when, as we have the conversation, we know that the IMF and the World Bank, as much as additional concessional uh, lending is going to be necessary, will not be able to provide us with the trillions we need. We're going to have to go to the markets. But what we want as emerging market economies is to go to the markets and get, you know, Japan today borrows at 0.25. Uh, 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 Egypt, which is one of our best performing economies on the continent, borrows at nine. Uh, uh, whereas the, the debt to GDP of Egypt is 60%, the debt to GDP of Japan is 125. So we need to fix that. And I think that is, therein lies the development problem today, is the cost uh, of, of access to liquidity. We must ensure that even as we fight climate change, we do it in a way that is accessible. Thank you very much for giving me a few minutes to come in. Honor of reading uh, those words for you all today. So these are the words of the former uh, German Chancellor, Dr. Angela Merkel, who uh, begins by saying that she sends her warmest greetings and best wishes to the Africa Roundtable, Europe and Africa. Together for a just green transition, I'm delighted to see decision makers from both Europe and Africa meeting for the first time on African soil to talk about new paths forward and approaches for a collaborative partnership. During my many trips to Africa, I have seen that this continent offers a wealth of opportunities and ideas and has promising growing markets and many active young people. They deserve the same chances and opportunities as people in Europe. They hold an enormous potential both on human and on an economic level, a potential that should not be lost. When I was chancellor of Germany, the idea of a collaborative partnership with Africa was already close to my heart. This is why in 2017, we launched the G20 Compact with Africa during Germany's G20 presidency, among other things. Its aim was to improve the conditions for private investment, as well as employment opportunities in Africa, working together with our African partners. For Germany and Europe alike, security, stability, and sustainable economic development on our neighboring continent are more important than ever. This is particularly true since global interconnection is increasingly part of all areas of our lives. 
This is why I particularly welcome civil society initiatives such as the Africa Roundtable, an opportunity for all to share their experiences to address and shape common challenges and opportunities faced in this field. The international political situation has become increasingly unstable over the past few years. War and violent conflicts are spreading with a disastrous impact on agricultural production. They are a major contributor to worsening world hunger, to migration and displacement. All of this especially affects Africa and we are currently seeing this very clearly against the backdrop of Russia's dreadful war against Ukraine. The coronavirus pandemic has also caused a lot of human suffering and had a devastating effect on the economy. In addition to this, climate change has wreaked havoc, causing droughts, torrential rain and flooding. Although their dramatic consequences can be felt all over the world, they affect Africans more. I welcome that the Africa Roundtable in Dakar has made this their focus. This challenge can only be overcome if we work together. Africa has made so much progress over the past few years, even in the past decades. Many economies have shown a very dynamic development. We now have to build on this trend and continue and expand existing projects and collaborations. Further growth in Africa requires energy. Africa has many hours of sunlight, hydropower, as well as good wind conditions. This is ideal for renewable energies, which could ensure Africa's energy security. Further expansion in this field requires targeted support, including from even more private investors. This is another focus of the Africa Roundtable. This is another reason I'm delighted that so many political, economic, and civil society stakeholders are coming together in Dakar to discuss Africa's challenges and opportunities regarding renewable energies, fighting climate change, healthcare, and nutrition, and to find solutions to these issues together. I wish you all promising new contacts, fruitful discussions, and the best possible success. Sincerely, Angela Merkel. Um, she remains committed uh, to her passion for seeing the relationship between Africa and Europe grow, uh, especially Africa and Germany as well. Okay, and with that, uh, Mr. Masiej Gulubieski, I want to hand over the floor to you now. Um, I'll remind uh, the audience that he is the head of Cabinet of Commissioner for Agriculture at the EU Commission. Uh, we can see you and the floor is now yours. Uh, let's say um, it's a very heady time right now towards the end of the year. And uh, I had to be here with, with my boss, uh, Commissioner Wojciechowski, but he also sends his greetings. Um, I, I, I like to come to um, Africa in general, as I started my career in, in the commission as an as a Africa desk, as a desk responsible for relations with the regional economic communities of East Africa and Horn and the Indian Ocean. So I, I, I don't know West Africa so well, but uh, I, I have very good memories uh, from, from my first experiences that, that went on for another five years once I joined. And I also have good experiences um, working with cooperating as, as the commission at the time, DG Development, with the German partners. Uh, at the time, I, GTZ, now GIZ, was uh, very much involved in the horn on the peace and security issues and other things. So um, we were we were always, I was always very impressed with how agile GIZ was uh, in, in uh, delivering very, very kind of quick uh, technical expertise uh, on short notice. It was always very impressive and very helpful. <clears throat> and, and it was a very good cooperation. Um, I was asked to deliver some remarks on this panel. Uh, the topic agriculture is a pillar of green transition. Um, since I'm speaking now as a, as a, as a person that dealing with EU agriculture, uh, not so much international agriculture issues, but I think whenever my commissioner, and he did travel to, to, to Africa recently, went to Zambia a few months ago. Uh, but when, when, when we speak about European uh, agriculture, I think uh, we see eye to eye oftentimes, not always, but I, 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 eye to eye with some of the African concerns. One is obviously that uh, Europe remains responsible for global food security. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, we 
all agree also with the African partners that sustainability is an issue that that um, basically sustainability is a necessary conditions for agriculture to exist into the future. But I think we also all agree, and my commission makes a very strong point always about this, that this is not a necessary, this is not a sufficient condition. We need to first and foremost preserve the livelihoods and resilience of farmers themselves, because without the farmers, even the sustainable world will not, <laughs> will not just have agriculture. We'll have sustainability without agriculture, sustainable environment without uh, without farming. Um, and we need primary producers. We need um, um, not. Uh, we even need uh, small and medium-sized farmers. And my commissioner is very fond of supporting. Uh, uh, those groups of farmers, which really, uh, and it's another similarity between Europe and Africa, we, we really are based on small and medium sized farms. Uh, he likes to quote a statistic, a foul statistics that 12% of farmers own up to two hectares of land. Um, that's very little. Average in Europe is around 12, 13 hectares. Uh, and uh, they are responsible for around 30% of world food production in terms of primary production. So. It's a huge, absolutely huge resource, and the power of local production, the power of local markets, um, is something that um, both in Europe, I think, where there's more attention to it now after after the crises, the COVID crisis now, with the Ukraine uh, invasion of Russia and Ukraine, um, Europe was looking very much outward, looking for international markets. It still does. It's still a superpower. It's the largest exporter of food, but we are looking at ways to create more local opportunities for for selling uh, our own food uh, and I think this is something uh, that Africa really needs to develop really good local uh, and self-sustainable and sustainable uh, uh, food production um, now I don't know which direction is best to go into and I don't know how much time I, I, I have allotted but uh, and I have a bit of a speech in front of me but I think I'll start quickly with the crises. Um, I think all of us globally are very concerned with what Angela Merkel just wrote in her letter. We have a uh, we have an invasion of Russia and Ukraine. We 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 suffer from uh, we've suffered from broken supply chain uh, networks. We we suffer from huge increases in inputs uh, for agricultural production. It's a huge problem around the world. Fertilizers issue. Uh, was and is continues to be a problem because of high gas gas prices, especially nitrogen based fertilizers. So the EU has reacted very quickly in this uh, new environment. It has uh, it has adopted a comprehensive response, and I'll, on on the global level, uh, it kind of revolved around four strands of action. Um, one is uh, first of all a solidarity strand, which basically meant that we stepped up our emergency aid and macroeconomic support for countries most in need. The second step, uh, the second strand is was a sustainable production strand um, uh, to drive the transition towards sustainable and resilient food systems in third countries, especially as I, when I, as I said, by investing in local small scale producers and food entrepreneurs. The third strand um, was to keep the markets open, is to increase transparency, facilitate food trade, uh, by getting grains out of Ukraine. Uh, my commissioner has played a personally instrumental role because of the fact that he comes from Poland and Poland is the largest hub that enables through so-called solidarity lanes and the uh, land route routes um, that, that export, which now has really uh, come back to uh, very high levels, um, uh, around 17 million tons of grains left Ukraine uh, since May through those land-based routes, which is more than what was uh, delivered through the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative, only 11 million tons was exported to this route. So it's a big success of our initiative. And the fourth was obviously and is a multilateral strand, uh, which uh, basically uh, we work with our partners such as UN, FAO, WTO, etc. We engage with regional economic communities, with African Union, naturally, just recently with a college to college meeting, and I'll get back to that uh, soon. So uh, with the African Union, obviously, which is kind of a, 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 an umbrella uh, in Africa, um, a, a umbrella organization, uh, we, we work very closely. We had regular meetings with African and European agricultural ministers. My, my commissioner was very active in those meetings. And we started to uh, prepare this next ministerial conference 
to take place in Rome in the summer of 2023. Uh, and I have to be very clear because I know this issue really uh, was a big topic of, of heated uh, discussions at the United Nations General Assembly. Um, it, we will always uh, advocate uh, and, and, and against any export restrictions and against any export bans on food and fertilizer. E e European Union has not put any sanctions on uh, food-based products after the war from Russia or fertilizers. Um, if there have been problems, they have to do with the fact that there is a bit of a chilling effect uh, when it comes to dealing with Russian operatives operations. And I think you know, some people just don't feel comfortable dealing with them, but it's not because of our legal actions against Russia that there was a problem with fertilizer access in certain parts of the world. I hope this has been remedied and um, our fertilizer communication of just, just recently has also made that point extremely clearly. Um, now, financials. Uh, I don't know if Director General, uh, 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 Mr. Duns, Director General of, of INPA mentioned this, but uh, I think it's important to mention that we've already committed uh, around 8 billion euros in, until 2024. Out of that, 2 billion euros uh, are, of, uh, are for humanitarian food and nutrition assistance. I'm talking with Africa. Uh, this year only, uh, global humanitarian food assistance is already over. 900 million euros, which is a 55% increase as compared to 21 and 80% as compared to 2020, which includes out of that uh, 2 billion, um, uh, out of, sorry, out of that 900 billion, 150 to address uh, food security in Africa, uh, Caribbean and Pacific, the so-called ACP group of countries, 100 million contribution to the IMF's, IMF's poverty reduction and growth trust, and further 210 million uh, euros at the November G20 meeting was announced for 15 countries in West, Central, East, and Southern Africa, including also the Middle East and and uh, and, and the larger um, uh, Asia and Latin America. Almost 5 bil billion euros of support to the transition to sustainable food sector in system in partner countries, um, including 350 million to address food security in Africa, ACP countries. Um, and 225 million for Middle East and North Africa. So these amounts will further increase uh, with support by through by, by EU member states on a bilateral basis, but also through the EIB, European Investment Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And, and, and we call it a Team Europe approach. We're trying to kind of crowd in uh, not just all our, um, um, let's say, various uh, pieces, uh, institutional pieces together and with our partners, but also we try to crowd in private sector investment uh, in sustainable food systems as well through, let's say, through our, e, for example, EIB. <clears throat> Mr. Bilobi, our... apologies to interrupt you there, but I just want to give you a cue to uh, start bringing your remarks to a sure. close. Sure, maybe I'll finish off uh, on our AU EU relations. So you are real familiar, obviously, on, on our, with our dialogue on agricultural policy uh, since 2016. You're familiar with the AU EU agri-food business platform. It's very active. Our farmers exchanges, our work on geographical indications, our mobility scheme on agriculture, agribusiness between European and European and Africa, VET veterinary schools. We also have cooperation on technical uh, and research um, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so uh, again, very, very uh, dynamic cooperation. Uh, and we're looking forward to the 30th of June, 2023, when there's going to be an AU EU agricultural ministerial. Um, now we have to look into the future. We have, the, we've had a, we still have a current food crisis, still have the war, uh, the crisis still with us. We need to ensure we do our best to continue our work to more, towards more resilient food systems in Africa, supporting local production uh, and trade um, through multilateral fora as well. So um, with that said, uh, I'm open to any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will be opening uh, to the round of questions and comments. But in the meantime, we'll pivot to our next speaker. Uh, and that is Ingrid Gabriela Hoven, uh, the Managing Director of GIZ. Uh, we see you, ma'am. Uh, and um, you can now unmute your microphone and continue with your remarks. We are discussing agriculture as a pillar of the green transition. 
Yeah, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, and um, many thanks to GPI for having me. And um, it is a privilege um, that we that I can address this really remarkable audience. Um, I was asked really to give some remarks from the perspective of an implementing agency. GRZ is working on behalf of the German government and the European Commission in more than 120 countries. Um, we operate in different sectors and fields um, and our key perspective is actually to build up institutions, framework conditions and capacities so that actually our partner countries uh, are being um, supported in actually contributing to the big transformation that lies ahead of us. Um, Mr. Golobieski has already alluded to the many, many overlapping crises. Also, um, the address by, by former Chancellor Angela Merkel has painted actually a picture that makes sure makes clear to us we have to act and we have to implement and act more quickly at a bigger scale. And certainly what has to come across to all the crises and this specifically also and it's important um, to forge bigger alliances and, and to mobilize collaboration to deal with these global challenges, especially we have to work more closely um, and more side by side with, with our African partners and, and friends. Couple of thoughts. I mean, the agri-food system has to be transformed tremendously. We have started when it comes to the achievement of the SDGs and the climate, Paris Climate Agreement, we concentrated on energy, mobility, organization issues. But I think over the last 18 months, it has become even more clearer that unless we also now start to transform uh, the agriculture and food system at a global scale, which requires a lot of local action, um, we won't get um, to contain global warming to 1.5 degrees, uh, which is absolutely necessary to avoid all the tipping points that become more and more clearer uh, when we read um, the many reports that we receive from uh, scientific bodies. And today's global food system massively contributes to climate change with up to almost 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. And at the same time, agricultural production is already suffering from a higher frequency of extreme weather events, such as extended droughts, heavy rainfalls, that are putting actually food production and rural livelihoods at risk. And healthy soils, forests, water streams are really a prerequisite for a healthy, productive agricultural system. At the same time, one has to say that the present and current agri-food systems ought to contribute tremendously to pollution and destruction of the environment and the planet. And it is deteriorating as it stands right now, actually, the livelihoods of, of the future. Um, and we depend on, on these very scarce resources to feed the growing, growing population. So the overall agri-food system has to become nature positive, as it has been called, and more resilient at the same time. And this has, of course, been intensively discussed during the UN Food Summit in 2021, and also quite recently in Sharm el -Sheikh. And I was quite surprised, but I was actually satisfied that now actually this specific sector has gained more more relevance and more attention by policymakers. And I hope that this is being then followed through by concrete action. Well, right now, the biggest challenge that the development community, the international cooperation community is facing is a bit that a lot of the attention provided to the food and agriculture system deals with the crises that are so obvious at the Horn of Africa due to Russian war on 
in the Ukraine. You have many, many countries that are fragile with respect to their food systems. So many, many efforts of the international community go into the immediately, so to say, um, livelihood saving mechanisms. And this is right. So we have we have to uh, we have to save lives. But at the same time, we have really to concentrate more on the long-term transformation. So the question is, how do we translate the global debate into local and effective action? And finally, we should also make sure that the available funding is used as a lever for transformation that serves at the same time people. Let me give you an example that we actually- Ms. Hoven, are you, are you able to hear me? Apologies, it's the uh, facilitator in Dakar. Are you, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Apologies, ma'am, but I'm going to ask you to perhaps if you want to park it here, um, because we are sort of running behind schedule and I have to release the minister in a few minutes. Um, I can allow you to just wrap up maybe in the next few seconds and I've got to hand to the minister who, who must leave uh, in, in the coming minutes. Absolutely. Please go ahead. I stop here and come back to it, if you may. Allow During me. the discussion, thank you so much to participants here in Dakar who would like to engage you. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Hoban from the GIZ. All right, Minister, I know that um, you are going to be, and, and she has to leave, by the way, to make sure that our dinner is ready. Uh, she's going to be seeing to that everything is sorted. So, so that is a very important engagement. And I'm hoping that those joining virtually are feeling what we call the FOMO, the fear of missing out, because really, if a minister is leaving to make sure all is in order, uh, then you know you're missing out for sure. But I, I, please come in now, because now we're talking about agriculture as a pillar of the Green Transition Minister. Thank you so much, uh, Christine, and her sense of humor. <laughs> uh, I, I decided not to, not to uh, you know, read the speech, because I want to share with you the vision of Senegal on a green transition in agriculture. Standing in the, the feet of my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, who's not here. Senegal in its national development plan has a pillar on what we call PSE um, Vert, which is a green, our national plan that is green, green Senegal. And in that uh, pillar, there's a focus on climate resilient agriculture. And how do you achieve climate resilient agriculture? Climate resilient agriculture has five pillars. The first pillar has to deal with issues of land and access to land as an enabler. So anything that can be do done at the local level, at the national level, on enabling access to land for farmers, for women, for youth. The second pillar of that green, smart agriculture is how do we improve productivity? As you know, our country is a net importer of rice. Food sovereignty is one of our top priority. We also want to develop our indigenous grains. As you know, Senegal has some superfoods such as fonio, such as millet that are gluten-free and that the world is asking for. So anything we can do to improve our productivity in rice and indigenous grains is critical. And in order to do that, we need to invest in water management, in renewable energy, solar pumps, and all the climate resilient technologies. We also need to, to ensure uh, that our farmers have insurance. So micro insurance, agriculture insurance to be able uh, to face um, you know, any disaster. That's pillar number two. The third pillar is financing. How do you finance green agriculture? The women of Africa are tired of microfinance. They want to get out of the ghetto of microfinance. And in order to do that, we want women on the continent, youth on the continent to have access to financial instruments that are in accordance with the needs. Patient capital, um, agri-insurance, uh, financial products that are aligned with the agriculture cycle, um, 
financing that allows them to to wait you know if you have a crop that allows you to you have to wait six months before the harvest how do you sustain yourself for those six months so much more complex financial inc instruments that include leasing of uh, farming equipment uh, guarantee funds credit lines that are dedicated to some funding so financing is a third pillar and it's critical and senegal has many instruments on that the fourth pillar of the green agriculture transition is access to markets if you help everybody get land be productive with the right financial products how do you make sure that everything that they pr produce is getting to market and that's everything you know. Senegal is doing on on e-commerce, on making sure that farmers are connected to buyers through technology. So access to market is critical. And lastly, really on the that is on the sole responsibility of the government is roads, its energy, its access to water, its technology, but it's also fertilizers. The two speakers mentioned the, the conversation about fertilizers and the whole issue of food security currently on the continent has nothing to do with food itself. Because I, I saw a lot of people think that, you know, if we don't send them wheat, they will, they will not have anything to eat. I think most Senegalese can live without a, a loaf of bread. You know, they'll eat their millet, their dege, whatever they call it in the region. And if you look at a country like Cote d'Ivoire, they will eat their banana palm plantain, their acheke. So the issue is not if you don't have wheat, then they will not eat. The issue is that how do we sustain our agriculture without fertilizers? At the G20, I was in the meeting uh, with the, the President Macron, the, the Chancellor of Germany, President Macky Sall, I think there was a, the Prime Minister of Netherlands. So there was a, a group of, of uh, presidents who met and the whole discussion was around fertilizers. And Africa was saying, we are not saying give it to us for free. We are saying you need to unlock the swift payment so we can pay for the fertilizers that we need. That, that was the conversation. So really the, 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 the food sovereignty, the food security, the green transition need to be anchored on how do we accelerate our productivity. Senegal is at the crossroads. We are going through our defining moments. To be able to, to, do, to produce fertilizers, you need gas and you need phosphates. Our country has both. So for us, 2023, which is the year where we are getting our first production of gas. We are looking at gas to power, but we are also looking at gas to industry and the whole transformation side of petrochemical industries. And that ties up to the conversation we had earlier on the Just Energy Partnership. Because for us to do a, a Just to Energy Transition Partnership, we will need to have a look at a, a much broader picture. And I think it's a colleague from the, 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 the African Development Bank who said, what is the big picture? Energy, as I mentioned in the five pillars, is just one pillar of this bigger picture, which needs to address so many other things. So this is what I wanted to share with you, not going through this 10-pager speech that I was given and bore you to death. <laughs> Dr. Beckman, I'll come to you now. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. And uh, very quickly, I think I changed like three times what I wanted to say listening to the others already. Um, I uh, start with liking to thank you. I think it needs these formats. Thanks, GPI colleagues. Thanks very much for the in invitation. I'm really honored to be here. And I just take away from myself. I mean, win-win is key. I think you, a couple of you said it earlier. It's not so much, of course, it's not a new thing, but it's not this thinking of like, what can we do for Africa? It is like, hey, how can we together really get out the potential? And I think we have to change how the way we think and we address things. Um, for me, this individual country by country case is very important because as you said, there is a storyline for each country 
having the, the, the my perspective on the North African countries is a different story again, um, but I have very much lived how much uh, we have supported as DFIs, for example, the renewable energy generation, which is now completely taking over by the private sector, but still there are needs for public investments remaining with public funds becoming much scarcer at the same time. So we have to think jointly what financing models are needed here and how to develop them further. And that's what I take away also ref respect, reflecting KFW Banking Group as a group. I mean, we have thought our offers through because we have different, so to speak, offers starting from the export financing to the German European industries, but also then, of course, our private sector MDG together with our development bank. And we have to, I think, think a little bit more how we can interconnect this, as well as we have to think as development banks together, how we how we put better packages together. So I really take away that as a homework <laughs> to do also and to think and um, and and to get into dialogue with what is needed and where can we probably uh, contribute each of us with pieces we can we can put to the table. I give two examples where we have started to do that. It's in the area of green hydrogen, where we have set up a platform um, and launched that recently at the COP, where we're really saying we want to promote private sector uh, initiatives and allow for some grants to be added to this to make things bankable, but also with different funding from different ministries in Germany, also allowing different perspectives. The one is about, okay, make things bankable. The other one is about um, developing the, the 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 local value change with country change with countries who have already a prone environment for the development of green hydrogen. So we really try to allocate through one platform different funding sources with different purposes. And I think this is a little bit the way, and then to offer that with banking sector instruments from the different parts of our group. So we would really try to, to make an effort in that regard, as we also do what um, actually um, uh, Kundun uh, earlier from the EU Commission uh, said. I mean, this uh, this idea of how to share the risk and how to offer appropriate risk mechanism. I mean, we also have some as, uh, aspects lounge for trying as DFIs, European DFIs, to have a joint offer together in this terms of uh, have the risk sharing. And again, for us as a banking group to have it from different sides, not only thinking in our mandates, which is very important, I believe. And last but not least, a point which I think hasn't been raised so much. I think we should also look in how to promote these integrative forces between the countries, because at the moment, countries think very much of course, individually on each country, as I said, this is the is core. But when we talk about potential for um, for the, for example, for regional integration or for integrating power grids, and I think there are examples where even power integration worked, where countries have not yet been so close. But still, this is very important to see what is the right dialogue platform to to lobby on that further, because I really believe this um, cross-regional infrastructure or cross-country infrastructure is also of core importance for the future, also when it comes to innovation and technologies to be transported, so to speak. So I stop here. I thank you very much. And I just got the signal I need to run to the airport because the traffic is terrible. So I think we need to do work on traffic options as well <laughs> and solutions. But I thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. I am going to to also excuse myself, but I will see you all at dinner at eight o'clock. Uh, and as you know, we are building uh, the tail air all the way to the airport. So next time you come to Senegal in December 2023, the tail air will take you all the way to the airport. That's the second phase of it. And I'll see you later. <laughs> Okay. See you later, Minister. See you later. And thank you, Dr. Beckman. Safe travels to you as well. So let's continue uh, with the conversation. I know that there were leftover uh, remarks from the uh, energy specific part of the conversation, but why don't we stay on theme now with agriculture? Um, and I'm keen to hear from, from Landessa. Uh, so Evelyn, please, why don't you take the floor? Thank you so much, uh, Christine, for the opportunity. Um, I think my brief remarks is first to appreciate the conversation that has been very rich. Um, I think the challenge of uh, looking at energy and the link to agriculture is knowing that it can be a give and take uh, in, two, in two folds, that energy is a driver of agricultural activities, as has been mentioned. And uh, this is critical in terms of enhancing productivity and ensuring uh, inclusivity 
of communities, if at all we are able to provide uh, or energy can be accessible to these communities. For smallholder farmers, often there is a challenge in terms of access, uh, both in terms of uh, how, I mean, energy is distributed and the extent to which they easily suffer exclusion from mainstream grid, uh, but also opportunities to bring in renewable energy like solar uh, has uh, to some greater extent tried to, to transform the space and provide these opportunities, but it's still very inaccessible uh, to most of the rural communities for reasons that this technology, as much as it's not that very expensive, but communities are still struggling to see how best they can be able to uh, achieve or reach uh, and be able to tap into this kind of uh, uh, technology. Uh, I don't think it's also highly subsidized in terms of uh, our countries, uh, in terms of communities to make it cheaper and accessible uh, for rural communities that are engaging in agriculture. But I think also the other part, which uh, uh, makes it uh, a bit tricky, and as I said, is a give and take. Even if energy is made available, and the communities and the uh, uh, investors who are investing in agriculture don't necessarily enjoy security of tenure or tenure rights, makes it uh, very uh, challenging in terms of the extent to which these communities can invest on long-term assets. And, and I say long-term on-farm assets, uh, like planting trees, like planting, for example, cash crops where they can be able to harvest and be able to, you know, uh, have long-term benefit from their own farms. And I think this also links to the whole question of uh, the extent to which uh, these very communities can protect their land from degradation. They can also take part in restoring the land, or they can probably be able just to maximize product. Yeah, looking at it from the point that as we secure tenure rights, we make communities give them power to be able to uh, have long-term investment on their land, be able to increase their productivity because then they are able to plan on their land, they are able to access inputs, they are also able to use their own land as collateral in, the, in case if they would want, for example, to access farm inputs, fertilizer, or even access credits to work on their farms. But when they do not have that kind of security, that becomes a challenge. As I said, energy is important, but for us to be able to also have a secure, sustainable and environment where land is protected, land is restored, and land is sustained in a highly productive way for future generation, but also for high productivity in agriculture, tenure security becomes a key component. Thank you. Yes, and please go ahead. I, I, I know you've been listening in. Uh, do you have some remarks and some uh, some input from what you've been hearing from the participants? Well, yes, well, very briefly, because my, my presentation focused more on the crisis response, obviously in a sustainable framework, but I think we need to be a bit more specific, maybe from my side as well. Um, there, there are a couple of issues that I heard that that obviously um, are, are, are key. Um, one is uh, sustainability in agriculture, especially when it comes, for example, to fertilizer use has to do with a more efficient use of fertilizer with more of a precise application uh, to ensure that our nutrient balance and then things like that. So I'm sure there are ways um, uh, such as um, targeted, um, uh, tailored precision farming techniques and digital uh, things that we work with Africa that can uh, influence the sustainable use of fertilizers. And, and, and it is obviously an issue. <clears throat> on, um, on insurance, there was a very important point because it is part of social sustainability. Uh, when my commissioner, uh, uh, when I came with my commissioner to COP27 for the Agricultural Day, there was a whole discussion with an Egyptian minister about insurance issues. How about having a bit more of a global approach to um, and, um, uh, providing some insurance, especially uh, crisis insurance, you know, against extreme weather events, etc., uh, or in general, um, in the context of more of a global approach. Um, that was something that my commissioner really, really um, uh, also supports. Um, in terms of um, uh, general resilience, because I think sustainability, my commissioners of the view that, and I will, I know I'm beating this into the ground, um, uh, that small and medium-sized farmers need to be given their role in, 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 in agriculture properly, that we should move away from unsustainable kind of <clears throat> large scale, sometimes over industrialized, overly intensive uh, modes of production. And the question I, and the challenge for the African uh, countries, as, as much as for a lot of European ones, is how to, ensure that small and medium ones can participate sustainably in this transition to, to the green uh, agriculture. Uh, I think uh, the local markets I mentioned are key and, and on the supply chains, uh, this is absolutely uh, crucial to build up more direct marketing approaches, more uh, building up local markets. The McKinsey report that you uh, sent us before the 
meeting. I think it talks quite well about the also the the whole complications in the kind of a supply chain, how much costs are multiplied through various steps along the way where the inputs are making their way to the farmers, how the input costs are, are also um, 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 creating um, 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 well, lack of economic uh, security uh, for farmers uh, with uh, up to 50% of markup for prices. There's a lot of issues there. The problem on, on sustainability is really how much Africa can really um, help their farmers and how we can help them internationally to meet those challenges because they are somewhat costly. The debate in Europe is about how we can, through our common agriculture policy, support them in meeting those costs because we need to teach for example, you can, you, farmers are willing to learn, but they, they need to teach them, let's say, sustainable fertilizing techniques. Uh, they need to get access to technology, to uh, geolocal ge uh, satellite data. <clears throat> they need to know how to measure nutrient balance in their in the soil. How to um, it, so it's it's all unfortunately requires investment, and oftentimes investment that's difficult in a sense that it targets a very very broad and large group of small and medium sized farmers. So. It's a it's 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 a challenge, but I but I but I hope uh, we can help you uh, in partnership uh, to meet it. Thank you very much. I want to come back into the room, um, Mr. Pope. I know you've not spoken, so Professor, please allow me to uh, give the floor to Mr. Stephen Pope from the Deutsche Post DHL. Thank you very much. I wanted to pick up uh, on some of the points raised by Evelyn, and it was it was nice to hear from Cabernet as well um, about about the key elements around sustainability. Um, one of the things in the McKinsey paper that that I picked up was um, the focus on intensification. I would say we need to walk, move towards efficiency. One of the area, other areas that the minister mentioned was on land use. Um, I think in the report itself, we should take out one sentence because it actually says that having nature reserves is a disadvantage. And we know globally there are issues and pressures on rainforest and land around the world. It, even though it's there, we, we shouldn't be including nature reserves in efficient use of land. Um, in terms of sustainability and security, um, one of the key elements for farmers in developing least developed economies is, is, is poverty. Um, Africa exports a lot of agricultural products, but as commodities. Um, and a key element within that needs to be value add. Um, and, and that goes back to the efficient use of it. We're, Africa exports a lot of commodities themselves, but the problem is because there is no value add, and this goes back to the, to the point that was raised by Cabernet here about supply chains, we need to look at more inclusive supply chains. If we're really going to move towards uh, a greener um, uh, way of farming, agriculture in general, we need to be able to give the wealth to the farmers to be able to do that. And we see that in Europe itself. You know, we talk about intensive farming, but there are a lot of small to medium enterprise farmers in Europe and around the world involved in certain commodities where the the amount of um, care that they can apply to the use of the land is proportionate to the wealth that they see. Um, a key example, I think, is the wine industry. The wine industry has moved massively um, towards biodiversity, um, and that has been proportionate particularly to those farmers who are wealthier. Now, we've seen that in coffee production. We see that also in, in tea production. There are already tea plantations, farmers in Kenya using organic fertilizers. They're all already moving in, in that direction, but the advantage that they have is that they're able to access directly to the markets. And I think, you know, we heard a lot about the amount of money that the EU is investing in supporting agriculture, which is laudable, absolutely. Um, what I'd like to hear a bit more about, okay, this is a big sum of money. Well, how, what are we going to do? You know, let's be specific. What are we going to do with that money? And I think one of the areas that we can do is not just in educating farmers and helping them to access markets, and see the potential not only to supply the local market but also international markets because let's be clear here in certain areas within agriculture in africa africa produces agricultural products of a very high quality that global markets will will would would, would cherish so we can we can access we can supply the local market but export as well and of course that brings currency in and helps farmers to invest as well yes financing from day one is a big issue and i think 
what Dr. Beckman mentioned about, about diversification around the flexibility of finance is a key element. But one of the priorities needs to be shortening those, those supply chains, market access. And I think one of the issues that we have is when we talk to a number of um, farmers, I was working, I was in the Americas recently, what we're finding in the agricultural industry, they're finding it easier to get into the American markets. The Americans are helping them directly in terms of removing red tape. And I think one of the things that we need to do, yes, we want to maintain standards in the EU, but part of that investment needs to be in terms of facilitating those farmers to access our markets as well. So non-tariff barriers don't cut them out. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mr. Pope. Um, Professor von Braun? And with well, uh, a brief remark on fertilizer and fertilizer markets. Fertilizer markets work, but brutally so. Um, first, um, African fertilizer factory in Nigeria uh, opened up um, this year, and um, the first six months of output was entirely sold out of Africa, mainly to Brazil, Europe, and elsewhere. We can expect, must expect, that um, the low levels of fertilizer use um, from about 20 kilos per hectare may go down to 10 kilos um, in the coming season. And that will pre-program uh, further food shortages uh, locally. I, um, I think we heard uh, excellent four points from Mr. Golubivsky and excellent five points from Minister Saar. My concrete proposal is um, connecting to Ingrid Hoven, who pointed at the opportunities following up on COP27, where for the first time the words water, food, and agriculture were in the closing statements. If you looked for them in COP26 and before, food, agriculture, and water were never mentioned. Um, so there is now mapped out, and that's the success of COP27, a four-year process to translate the words into action. And I believe Europe and Africa should play key roles in translating this agenda into action. If we look at the two key documents on the European side and on the African side, they need updating. On Europe's side, it's a farm to fork strategy. The last two pages have an international focus. It is outdated. It is pre-crisis. On the African side, it's the Malabo Declaration. It is outdated. And the CARDAP goals are not sufficiently up to date and too simple for a food systems approach. So I think there's need for homework on both sides and a great opportunity to come on one page using the four points which we heard today from the EU and the five points which we heard from Senegal today as a basis. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Ms. Hoven, we'll come to you now uh, online. Okay, see, she's not here anymore, but um, we can come back into the room to our participants here and perhaps even Mr. Gorobieski, if you want to come in as well, we, you're free to do so. Any questions uh, to him directly can be addressed right now if you've got questions for people in the room as well. Um, no, I, I, I really enjoy, I, I really like the, 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 the comments that I just heard. I mean, um, there, there, there are a couple of points that, that make a lot of sense. It's amazing how many parallels you can draw uh, between Europe and Africa, of course, the scale um, of incomes uh, is different, but in terms of problems, um, it's similar. The value added and processing, absolutely. I mean, pr uh, primary food production without creating value added uh, and through the proper processing industry is also a problem in, in, in certain countries of Europe. Uh, those slightly less industrialized and more traditional uh, in agriculture, like Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and others. Um, uh, that that is something that I think we have to apply in Europe, and those experiences can be then sold, sold, <laughs> not not in money terms, but shared uh, with with the African partners. That, that's one. Another one is this exploitation in the supply chain. Uh, the, 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 
in Europe, uh, uh, we have uh, recently started implementing, and the member states have been transposing the unfair trade practices directive, which talks about unfair trade practices of, let's say, buyers vis-a-vis -vis the smaller, especially smaller deconcentrated producers, where they basically can charge them high prices or they can withhold uh, payments, etc. You know, extremely disturbing practice in the supply chain that actually only large ones can can with, withstand, but not the smaller ones. Another experience, another um, 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 best practice or, or, or an idea for the African situation where I'm sure there are unfair trade practices that, 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 that don't help. Um, um, uh, on the farm to fork strategy, that is true. The, the, the sec last two pages of farm to fork, read a bit like an afterthought. Uh, the whole talk about global green alliances uh, had to do more with ensuring that our standards are shared globally. And, uh, and it was interpreted one way or the other by, by those who considered them, uh, you know, uh, more or less protectionist. But I think there needs to be more precisely on productivity, on exchanges of best practices, on creating resilient um, and, and, and uh, uh, resilience to external shocks. And I agree that we should work globally on those things. So, um, you know, any global initiatives that go in this direction, um, you're right, should be part of a future approach. Um, so thank you very much uh, for, for all these very, um, very uh, apt, uh, well-taken points. Uh, I'll take note, I take note of them. Thank you very much. I'll come back to the room if there are any. Mr. Niedema. An another attempt to make my point of introducing high technology into Africa. Agriculture is a perfect example. And uh, Mr. Golubevsky mentioned it. So remote sensing uh, from uh, the space via internet from space will be a helpful tool. Uh, to make an efficient uh, progress on usage of fertilizers, of irrigation, and all these uh, things to, to make agriculture more efficient in even remote places. And I want to repeat my appeal here um, that there is a new EU satellite constellation coming up. And our pledge is uh, that we should into, uh, um, include Africa in this new European venture. So let's make use of this European uh, effort to include Africa as a technology partner here. So let's create an internet via new space technologies here in this country, and that will help everywhere, uh, and in particular in agriculture. Thank you very much. Uh, the voice from industry there. So if, if we're sort of done with these, uh, I would like to maybe just go around the table and collect uh, thoughts uh, from everybody here. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands, so why don't we do that? And Evelyn, we'll start with you. Just your reflections um, before we get the real close uh, for, for the day. Uh, in, in a short sentence, um, your takeaways, and particularly as it pertains to what we need to do, right? The concretes um, to make this um, more about getting actual actions that we can um, put together. So we'll start that way, and then we'll get our final close from you, Mrs. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think it seems to get the best opportunity to be the first one. Um, I think what I would say in my observation is that uh, recognizing that uh, our countries and our communities vary from, you know, uh, di you know by context, by uh, situations, by levels of poverty, uh, just to contextualize that these conversations will impact communities directly. And that women and men, uh, the young people and children will be interacting with the questions on energy access, on agriculture differently. So the gender perspective has to be teased out uh, or be given uh, critical attention. I think from all the discussion, I rarely had somebody speak about the gender impact of what we are discussing. And I think this needs to be given attention. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's sufficient, sure. Thank you, thank you very much. So very quickly, um, a very productive day two concrete recommendations the first one is i didn't i don't see africa industry in the room and if we are going to have conversations about green transition and the partnership between europe and africa we need africa industry in the room so that would be my first point my second point is um, around regional integration we've spoken a lot about the distinctive nature of countries and I was really struck by Dr. 
I'm going to get the name wrong, um, Dr. Kubi's comment around, you know, a case by case review of use of gas as a fossil. Um, and we heard earlier on how these read countries are interlinked and how we need to build regional grid systems and regional solutions. And so one suggestion is if Africa is going to truly transform its economies, it's, going, it's not gonna be nation state by nation state. We've got to look and think regionally and help countries work and think regionally. And green, green growth is one way in which this continent can really transform its um, economy in a rapidly different way. But it will not happen if we are treating countries at silos, we can't afford to. It will not happen if the conversation does not include African industry at the table. And it will not happen if the difficult conversations are not being held at both the national and regional level. So those would be my points. We'll cross over to you, Professor. You see, uh, resilience, a resilient economy requires uh, on the climate front, uh, mitigation, adaptation, and transformation. Um, I'm really concerned that uh, a too strong a focus on adaptation um, may um, divert attention from mitigation and addressing the climate, big climate issue, because um, in a three degree world, plus three degree world, um, adaptation runs dry and is infeasible. So we may like to, for the next dialogue, come back to that. And I very much support what Mavis just said regarding green growth, a circular bioeconomy approach um, with a lot of science and knowledge input is the way to go. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pope. Thanks very much. Um, in, in general, I think, as I mentioned earlier on, I think the, the important thing is, um, particularly within agriculture, is shortening supply chains and increasing, um, well, I don't want to call it wealth, but give a greater income further down the chain, because I think that will help in terms of financing um, greener agricultural um, practices. And we're already seeing it in pockets across, across the country. I like Wolfgang's point about digitalization. I think it does have a big point to raise. And I, and I must admit, a big thumbs up to that. I think, I think that would be a really good opportunity for us to play and I think in terms of the green deal and the way that the EU goes forward I think part of that investment needs to be co-creation with Africa that was started under under the presidency of the G20 of, of Germany and I think co-creation um, in terms of uh, greener world is, is, is the way forward really taking Africa as a serious partner and not talking about how much money we spend, but actually talk about what we're doing and what comes out of it. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I think I will also pick up from, uh, you know, Wolfgang's uh, uh, talk about the technology. I think it's very important, uh, you know, for a good cooperation between Europe and Africa that we look into how to help Africa uh, uh, leverage uh, technology in particular, you know, the digital technologies. But also uh, how Africa, we can, we need to help Africa uh, invest more into the research to agriculture, because I think that's one way of addressing the vulnerability of the agriculture in Africa is really to invest into research of, you know, like uh, climate smart agriculture in particular, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, agricultural input that are more climate resistant, you know, drought resistant uh, 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 agricultural products. Uh, but also, you know, how to transfer these research product from labs to the farmers, how to make uh, climate information available to farmers, you know, smallholders in particular, who 
I mean, generally don't have access to, you know, big technologies, but, you know, now we have cell phones and, you know, like very low cost, uh, you know, technologies, how to make it available at that level, you know, to, to, to farmers. I think this is the challenge and I want to see more discussion on that, you know, in the future. Thank you. Thank you again on agriculture. I think um, if we are we are looking for a low hanging fruit for Africa's uh, green transformation, in my view, it is in the agriculture sector because this is the main agriculture uh, economic activity in the in Africa. And yet, uh, there are several challenges in in the sector that are, I mean, in my view, very easy to to to, to address. And I think this is a sector whereby Africa needs to feed itself and also help feed the world because the potential is there. I read somewhere that Africa has 60% of the existing Arab land in the world. This is a huge potential. And Africa has the youthful population in the world. In my view, we need to move away from the current rain-fed agriculture in the context, in the current context of uh, climate change, to um, irrigated agriculture, uh, and this requires just uh, some shift of, of in the mindset and also some technology uh, which are available. And I also think that uh, climate smart agriculture is fine, but uh, again, uh, we is, we let's start with simple things just to feed ourselves. I think it doesn't make sense that with the potential that the continent has. We still import a lot of food. We depend on on external sub, external support, humanitarian support when there is any climate crisis. And I think we need to make finally agriculture a business, a good business for for our youth population, youthful population. I, I, we need to attract them in that sector. It's not yet. Uh, let me say that what sex is enough enough to 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 attract the the youth. How can we make sure that this potential can be harness in order to, to contribute to Africa's agricultural transformation. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm going to switch you to French. It's the end of the day, so allow me. <laughs> um, merci. Thank you for this great afternoon. Lots of uh, food for thought. I am a representative of the private sector, and I agree with what Madame Bonso said. For this particular type of discussions, we need to have the African private sector, not just industry, but also SMEs, which are at the heart of the economy. And what came out of the McKinsey report was the need for adaptation uh, with regards to what's coming to us, consequences of the climate change. Whether it's the drop in income from fossil fuel, droughts, what are we to do as a continent? We need to create massive job creation. How do, do, do we achieve that? Well, we need to develop the uh, private sector and strengthen our SMEs and all the reflection that's done on funding. We have certain expectations with regard to our governments investing in technology. But we also want the, yes, the private sector to develop, to create jobs for the youth. In a small country like Senegal, we have 300,000 new young people joining the job market without any particular opportunity. And this has uh, a lot of risks. So as an investor in SMEs, especially women-run SMEs, that's what our, our main concern is. And we have to do that as our in to do that as investors, and we do also look at the mitigation aspect. We do pay attention at the impact of such uh, activities on the uh, environment. But I think tomorrow I'll get a better chance to discuss with you the various uh, companies we are uh, interested in, how we work with them, how they are involved in the uh, supply chain and value creating chain and what they think about the uh, environmental impact of their action. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Golbieski, I'll come to you next. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for, for having me here. I, I, I very much sympathize with every, everybody's points that just been made. Uh, sustainability is not a one-size-fits solution. Uh, uh, I think uh, Europe is diverse and Africa is even more. We need to pay attention to, to differences. We cannot... Uh, um, look to the worst, let's say, the worst polluter, and through that prism, 
uh, uh, let's say, impose sustainability on those who are already close to sustainable practices. And we need to recognize those and add value to them. There are a lot of, especially small and medium ones, uh, so size farms that actually in Africa and also in parts of Europe, but in Africa especially, I think they're already close to, a, to, to the sustainable circular economy model. Uh, we need to reap, um, uh, we need to use this potential <clears throat> rather than reinvent the wheels. I think Africa is extremely well placed to, uh, to produce sustainably, produce self-sufficiently and become resilient to external shocks. But as long as we take that, uh, as we like to call it in Europe, subsidiarity approach, regional approach, regional economic community approach, uh, et cetera, um, to, to our um, green goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back into the room, Mr. Niedema. Perhaps uh, to echo Mavis' uh, wish to have some uh, African industry representatives here, perhaps a good idea for the next round table, but there's good news for you. There is stable channels uh, between our association and our member associations, the uh, Business Council, and uh, next week, by, for your information, we will be meeting in Johannesburg with 500 people from Germany and all African, not all, but many African countries to have direct uh, discussions among the private sector. Um, and I would also like to echo what you said, uh, that um, regional approaches or pan-African approaches, I said that before, is key, because then the markets are getting more attractive and the business case is clearer. Um, a general uh, remark to today's uh, experience, uh, I'm, I'm really satisfied to observe that we have left this uh, development cooperation mode and we go more into co-creation and eye level cooperation. And, and that's really good to observe and thanks for that. I want to mention two of the white elephants in the room and then we'll add a third one. The first one of course is finance and finance means getting cheap money, not giving development money to, to here, it's also needed, but gi uh, give access to cheap money, that's, uh, uh, that's crucial. Uh, the other point about uh, finance is investment. We need investments, private investment. In the end, in the end it's only private investment that makes a sustainable switch um, so this is a one white elephant. The other white elephant that had not been addressed yet is competition. We are a little bit too, too relaxed uh, on the European side uh, in discovering uh, the African continent. This continent is already occupied uh, and is already uh, developed by many others. Uh, naming the Chinese, naming US, naming the Arab states, all of the countries, Senegal, where we are in, they have huge, huge uh, links to the US, the Arab uh, uh, countries and others. So if we hesitate for too long, it will be gone. Um, so those have been uh, the two uh, elephants. And the third thing I wanted to mention and I'm happy it is really diminishing, is that it is not that we think we can tell you something, but that we learn that we have to learn from you. Uh, and this is extremely important. So really changing the narrative. And I'm so happy that all of you are part of that change management. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll get our final input uh, from you, Mr. Elhaj Asil. Um, you're from the Kofi Annan Foundation, but you, your task is really to, to seal us off for, for the day, really, with uh, your input there. And so I'll now hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it will be uh, very difficult to, to do that without simply, you know, repeating all the good points and the takeaways you know that people have already expressed around the table <clears throat> but maybe let me bring you you know back to a broader frame 
when in the heat of the Paris uh, negotiations, then Secretary General of the UN Ban Ki-moon was asked, what is your plan B? He said then, I have no plan B because there is no planet B. There's only one and only planet we share. There's only one and only humanity we share. Africa has a stake in climate change. Africa has a stake in decarbonization. So we are not in a position where Africa should be convinced that decarbonizing is a good thing to do, protecting the environment, the good to do, good thing to do. And not doing so, you know, would be in contradiction with its own development. I think there is a lot of thinking going on. There are a lot of analysis going on, you know, to see, you know, how development can go hand in hand with all the other right thing to do for the climate and then for humanity, which is a common good we share. Some of you have said that it is more than energy transition. It is a much wider, it is green transition. And I say it is even wider than green tra transition. It is a transition at all level and from all different perspectives. It starts with each of us, our individual behaviors, our attitudes, our consumption patterns, our eating habits, our means of transport, our mobility, the light we use or not, it all starts there. And for some of us, it's the comfort or luxury. For others, it's the necessity because the baseline is very different. And any government and any leadership can be defined in many thousand pages of leadership book. It boils down to very simple things. What are the solutions we find to respond to the needs of the people? Either we pass the test or we fail. And if the test is fail, trust will be eroded. And I stress trust will be eroded at local level, at a national level. Trust in governments, trust in all the formal institutions. We can have all the ministers lined up here talking about wonderful plans. If there is no trust by communities and the population will not go nowhere. What can maintain the trust is to deliver on the promises we make. Too many promises made, too many promises broken and no accountability. We promise access to water to the communities. They don't get it. We access them, access, we promise them access to health. They don't get it. We promise them access to energy. They don't get it. And then we want to convince them for the transition with another promise and then where the trust will be coming from. We can uh, expose and then uh, translate that at the global level. We hear a number of times, you know, the numbers, you know, that are being put, 130 billion that are needed, you know, for the fund in loss and damage, you know, another, another 100 billion compensation here and there. Then when we then look at what has been delivered across the board, at best 30%, you know, at worst, you know, we're between 10 and 20%. What is the accountability to deliver on the promises we make in order, you know, for us, you know, to maintain, you know, that kind of a trust and then credibility that will be the basis of any partnership that we would like to build. And at the end of the day, the issue why we are here, it is about partnership, isn't it? And nowadays, there are so few places in a world that is so fragmented and in a world that mistrust is ruled, 
is ruling. It is, there are so few places where we can have a table like this that is a safe environment with respect and with dignity where we can talk about difficult issues at least in two directions. One is how can we deepen our understanding of complex issues because issues are complex. And then what are the avenues that we can explore together in order to come up you know, with complex solutions to complex problems because there will not be a simple solution. Everybody is looking for a fix. Everybody is looking for a silver bullet. There won't be any. There will be a journey, a journey of learning, a journey of sharing, a journey of building trust and then complementing each other along you know, that way. There are many other aspects. I think that somebody mentioned it you know, at the end here. We're not alone. If we're not alone, then, then we have to make sure that the space that we carve is a meaningful space, you know, that will be leading us, you know, to concrete outcomes. And those concrete outcomes, each of them will be a kind of a stepping stone, you know, to continue to strive, you know, higher. Green energy, we need solar, but we need storage. We need storage, then, then we need batteries. 70% you know, of the uh, shares of cobalt are owned by the DRC, 70% of the whole cobalt world is owned by DRC. But 80% of the industrial cobalt in DRC are owned by China, 80%. Sixty-five percent of the refined lithium in the world, you know, is owned by China. So when we have COVID and then lockdown in China because of zero COVID policy, you know, you have shortages even in iPhones, you know, that should be coming on the market. You know, the reality. You know, if you want, you know, green mobility and you know the. Uh, Legislators, you know, in Europe uh, and then in North America want, you know, the cars, you know, to go electric. And some major car manufacturers, you know, in Germany, you know, want to lead. They need that battery, those batteries, where they're coming from, where it's a lithium. Because unless that supply chain is green, then it will not get you then what you want. Again, another expression of our interdependence you know, that will be forging, you know, the kind of a partnership, you know, that we would like to see. But there is one other element why we want to do all of that, and that has not been talked about throughout the day. It's health. We're just coming out of, or well, we're not completely out of the hood with COVID, but has revealed all the dysfunctionalities that we can imagine in an equal world, Oh, that is leading to a dissolution in global solidarity. There's so much broken there that we have to heal again, and then healing it again is to rebuilding, you know, the trust. If we see a certain attitude, for example, you know, of Africa in the uh, Ukraine crisis, it is linked somehow with all the world attitude and then the relationship with Africa during the COVID pandemic in terms of sharing of resources, sharing of vaccine, sharing of commodities, sharing of masks and masks and even paracetamols that you could not find. Now, the geostrategic location of a crisis should not determine the level of interest, the level of engagement and the level of commitment and the level of resources. Shocks and hazards you know, are happening across this continent right here in the Sahel that is leading to instability. Mali, Paso, military, military coup, just around, you know, the neighboring countries. Nigeria, almost ungoverned. The region, the, which is called the Liptako Gorma region, which is, you know, southern Algeria, you know, western Libya, and then 
Mali, almost in our government. Famine in Somalia, instability in South Sudan. We can talk about adaptation, we can talk about mitigation, all right things there, and right elements you know, to adopt. You can't adapt to famine. You can't adapt to hunger. Because it's simply not normal. It is not normal nowadays, you know, in 2022, you know, that children are going to bed hungry and people are dying of hunger and it is happening. So our takeaways here should be very frank ones that are destined, first of all, to our own leaders and to the, our own governments, the African governments, that we need to get our th all things in order, you know, to have a governance mechanisms, you know, that are right, to create the space, you know, that is conducive, you know, for business, to create the stability for people and then the citizens to feel safe, and then to satisfy the basic needs of our citizens. So no one and nobody should do that for us. And it is a government to say. So I think we don't need, you know, any kind of a fancy, you know, brochures, you know, a sophisticated plan, but I don't know any consulting, you know, world consulting group, you know, to do that. With the naked eyes, you know, you go into any village, you know, in this country and in this continent, there are things to do, and then we can do that. Let's feed ourselves, we say. Well, what's why it is, what's miraculous about that? What is so complicated about it? You know, we need to do that. And that's when the trust, you know, comes. It is only then, you know, that we will have the legitimacy and the credibility to challenge the world order, which is becoming a world disorder, you know, nowadays. You know, to challenge also, you know, the partners, you know, to get into a partnerships as equal partners, you know, that are with mutual respect and where we learn mutually and then where we share, you know, what we have. I think what we are starting here is in maybe one step, you know, in that journey. And I really hope that uh, alongside, you know, that road will bring along the citizens, which is very important because all things start with communities and it will end right there in those communities. There, that's where it will happen or not. And that's where the impact will be felt or not, the citizens. And then the different forms of organizations of those citizens. And those different forms, you know, are all the way, you know, from the private sector, which is a form, the civil society organization, which is a form, even the government with a form of organization, you know, of, you know, the citizens. And I think, you know, if we are all inspired and motivated and moved you know by that spirit you know maybe that is the journey that we you know continue to travel you know, berlin was a step dakar is another one there will be certainly another station and then time and lapse between those and we should maybe think of how can we continue to nurture and feed you know that kind of a partnerships you know so that when we meet again we take stock and then go back and then see that, you know, we've traveled and then we've traveled far and then we've reached, you know, somewhere together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and that does it for our first day of deliberations uh, here in Dakar at the second edition of the Africa Roundtable in 2022. There's, there's so much uh, for us to go back and reflect upon. I know for some of us who are here for the first time, uh, the whole experience um, is just a lot to take in in itself. But I'm encouraged by the conversations we've had here today. I think we've uh, somebody mentioned that we've really moved past this point of is, is this an equal partnership because that's established uh, by now. And I just want to again take a moment to thank you all for 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 your insights, for for your the questions you've asked, uh, for everything that you've contributed to our discussions here today. Because that is what this Africa Roundtable is about. You each carry your own weight as stakeholders, bringing in your respective experience, um, and it's it's about our peoples uh, who have shared ambitions. Uh, for prosperity, the desire for prosperity and for security. Um, and I think that as we as we grapple the crises that we face as partners in Europe and Africa, there is certainly room for making these uh, opportunities um, felt by 
our citizens, as, as we heard, uh, young people, especially here on the continent of Africa, who, who want opportunities um, so that we don't have to have tragic stories of people dying in the sea, uh, because there are many opportunities that could be created here. So I'm so happy to say that uh, it's not over, because uh, I almost want to say the best is yet to come, because tomorrow we'll be really putting a focus uh, on empowering the women. We've talked about agriculture here today, but tomorrow's program specifically uh, will be about empowering women to feed a continent. Uh, somebody said, I didn't hear enough about women today. Well, tomorrow will be all about uh, women. So there will be uh, the indulgence. And so I want to uh, encourage us all to, to be on time for this. Um, we have uh, several high level uh, ministers uh, on this side as well, in terms of the, the government uh, in Senegal, uh, including the Minister for Women and Children, um, as well as the state uh, Minister of State to the President of the Republic of Senegal. Uh, she is... Um, in fact, very familiar to, to a lot of us. So I just want to uh, tease tomorrow and say we're going to be getting deeper into issues of land rights and, and private sector uh, involvement, food policy for resilience, the investments, the innovations and the opportunities specifically um, for women and the role of women in international cooperation. Senegal's Minister for Women, Family and Child Protection will be here. Her Excellency uh, Fatou Dian, uh, another powerful woman here in Senegal. We've seen the example here of um, Minister Olimar Chessa. 